Gather yourself together with Fringes. Fringes is a new social networking app for the community. Are you looking to study, teach, cook, play, sew, and travel? Perhaps you're new to the area and are tired of spending Sabbaths alone? Are you looking for a place to post your events, products, and services? Rejoice! Fringes is here. Download free today. Available on Google Play and the App Store. Peace and greetings to you. This is Amuna Yisrael, affectionately known as the First Lady of Debate Talk for you. I have enjoyed coming to you week after week, you know, season after season, growing together, speaking about the difficult topics, investing the energy, time, and effort with our brothers and sisters on the panel. Today, I would like to come to you with an opportunity for you to invest in something that I've been working on and that's near and dear to me. It's called the Yummy Cottage. You can learn more about it at www.gofundme.com backslash the yummy cottage we're currently fundraising so that we can get it off the ground and your help would be appreciated once again www.gofundme.com backslash the yummy cottage check the link in the box and hope to hear from you soon don't touch that dial you're now listening to the big talk free radio Can a Hebrew, non-Hebrew, be saved? Can you hear me? Loud and clear, brother. Loud and clear. Okay. Can a non-Hebrew be saved? God created the heavens and the earth and everything in it. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. God made man in his image and in his likeness. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. Man disobeyed God's commandment in the Garden of Eden and allowed sin into the world, spiritual and physical death passed upon all men, and all men became sinners, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Now, it was Satan who deceived Eve and caused them to disobey God and caused the penalty of sin to plague all men. But God prophesied of the Savior that would save the world from the penalty of sin in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art, art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Later on in this opening statement, we're going to look at who this seed is. Notice it says, thou shalt bruise his heel. So this is talking about a person. In Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, it says, sin caused man to become so wicked that God repented that he made man. So God destroyed man with a flood, all of mankind except for Noah and his family. So in Genesis chapter 10, you'll see the nations that descended from Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. In Genesis chapter 11, you'll see another act of sin by the people at the Tower of Babel, and you see God scatter the people in their languages because of this sin. Then I found something that, uh, excuse me, very interesting, uh, and I see it as God beginning to choose a people or a line of people to fulfill his will, purpose, and plan. Notice at the end of Genesis chapter 11, it lists the genealogy of Shem. In his lineage it's only, not Ham's, not Jacob's. And then in chapter 12, it says God chose Abram, a man from Shem's lineage, out of the land of Ur of, Ur of Chaldees, commanding him to leave his country and his people, and God made a covenant with Abram. I see this as being the first example of God calling someone to him out of a heathen nation. But I want you to pay atten close attention to what God says concerning this covenant with Abram. He says in Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now remember, this is the foundational covenant 
that everything else concerning Israel and salvation is built on. In Exodus chapter 2, verse 24, it says, God remembered his covenant with Abraham and delivered them out of Egypt. And in Leviticus chapter 26, God said, if Israel broke the covenant he made with them, which we'll talk about that covenant in a minute, their salvation would be that he would remember the covenant he made with Abraham. But notice, God said all families of the earth will be blessed through him where this covenant is concerned. Then in Genesis chapter 22, verse 18, God says, again concerning this covenant, that his seed, in his seed, shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Now, in verse 17, God addresses the nation that will come out of him as his seed and that he will multiply them as the stars of heaven. But in verse 18, he's addressing Jesus as, his, as the seed that all nations of the earth will be blessed through because look at what Galatians chapter 3, verse 16 says. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not and to seeds, meaning plural seed, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So Paul confirms that God was talking about Christ as the seed when it comes to certain parts of the promise made with Abraham. And remember again, in this seed, all nations of the earth, earth would be blessed. I assume the audience all knows the story of how God fostered the nation of Israel through Abraham, seeds, Isaac, and Jacob, and how he delivered them out of bondage in Egypt. So let's fast forward to Exodus 19 and look at the conditional covenant God made with the nation of Israel. In verse 5 it says, now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and will keep my covenant, then shall you be a peculiar treasure above all people, for the earth is mine. And we know that the Ten Commandments God gave them in Exodus 20 through the law, uh, laws in the book of Leviticus, were the covenant they, they had to keep to be God's chosen people and for God to be their God. But if they didn't keep the covenant, they would be punished and many times cut off as God's people, as we see in Hosea. Many of them died in the wilderness, including Moses, and didn't see the promised land because of their murmuring and disobedience. So now you have a nation of people who have Yahweh as their God, along with his covenants, laws, and promises, which the law kept them and was their salvation in the Old Testament. And you have the rest of the nations as his enemies, who are without God, without his covenant, laws, and promises, and are lost and dead in their trespasses and sins. So now the question is, did God provide a way of salvation for the rest of the nations, or did God provide a way for other nations to become his people and experience God's blessing through the covenant he made with Israel? Yes, a non-Israelite could join themselves to the Lord, and the Israelites, through their males being circumcised, and through committing to keeping the law, which God's co keeping the law, which is God's covenant with Israel. Now, I need to define a couple of terms for you so you can better understand the scriptures I'm going to provide um, concerning a non-Israelite joining himself to God and to the Lord. Uh, now, I need to um, go over the word proselyte. The biblical term proselyte is used in the Greek Old Testament for stranger, which is a newcomer, newcomer to Israel, a sojourner in the land. In the Greek New Testament, first century convert to Judaism. A stranger in the Hebrew is gar, G-A-R-O-G-E-R, -E a sojourner, a temporary inhabitant, a newcomer lacking inherited rights, a foreigner in Israel through conceded rights, a Gentile. The term Gentiles is derived from the Latin word used for contextual translation and not an original Hebrew or Greek word from the Bible. Uh, the original words goy and ethnos refer to peoples or nations. Uh, Latin and later English translations selectively use the term Gentiles when the context for the base term peoples or nations refer to non-Israelite peoples. Or, or nations in the English translation of the Bible. 
All of these terms can be found in the Hebrew and Greek lexicon on blueletterbible.org, which I've seen my opponent use. Now, let's look at groups of people that joined themselves to the Israelites in the Old Testament. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 38, we see that God is delivering the Israelites out of Egypt. And it says in verse 38, and the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men beside children, and a mixed multitude went up also with them in flocks and herds, even very much cattle. Now, seeing that a mixed multitude went up with them out of Egypt, in verse 48 it says, And when a stranger sojourned with thee and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. Numbers 15, verses 14 and 15. And if a stranger sojourn with you, or whosoever be among you in your generations, and will offer an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord, as ye do, so he shall do. One ordinance shall be both for you of the congregation and also for the stranger that sojourns with you an ordinance forever in your generations. As ye are, so shall the stranger be before the Lord. Leviticus 19, 34, 33, and 34. And if a stranger sojourn with thee in your land, ye shall not vex him, but the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you, and thou shalt love him as thyself. For ye were strangers in the land of, land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Now, this is the dagger that I used in the last debate that me and him had, which is Esther chapter 8, verse 17. In every province and in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day, and many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. Now, let's look at this. It takes us into individual people that join themselves to the Israelites. The same thing was said by Rahab the harlot in Joshua chapter 2, verse 9. She said, and the scripture says, and she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land and that your terror is falling upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land, excuse me, um, let me scroll back up, faint because of you. So we see the fear of the Lord and the fear of, of the favor that was on Israel caused people to join themselves to Israel. And we know Rahab was saved uh, through receiving the spies. And she is listed in Hebrews chapter 11 with the people of faith. I'm having a little technical difficulty here. Okay, in Numbers 13, verse 6, it says of Caleb, of the tribe of Judah, Caleb the son of Jephunneh. Now, how can Caleb be of the tribe of Judah and he's the son of Jephunneh? Because in Joshua chapter 14, verse 6, it says, Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God. Now, we know that Kenaz is the progenitor of the Kenizzites in Genesis 36 and 11. And we know that the Kenizzites were one of the peoples that Abraham is told he's going to overtake in, in Canaan. So as you can see, Caleb had to be a proselyte of the tribe of Judah, seeing he was a Kenizzite. Some say they probably were proselytes through Jephunneh marrying a woman of Judah. I don't know. But I know that he had to be a proselyte because he is numbered as a, that he was ado adopted by the tribe of Judah. Ruth, we know in chapter 1, verse 16, it says, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, talking to Naomi, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God shall be my God. And we know that Ruth married into Israel through Boaz, and they had Obed, who begot Jesse, who begot David. So we know that Ruth was in the lineage. Here are some prophecies concerning the people joining Israel. 
Deuteronomy 28, uh, 23, verse 7 and 8. Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite, for he is thy brother. Thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian, because thou wast a stranger in his land. The children that are begotten of them shall enter into the congregation of the Lord in their third generation. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 10 and 12. Ye stand this day, all of you, before the Lord your God, your captains of your tribes, your elders, and your officers, with all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and thy stranger that is in thy calf. From the hewer of thy wood unto the drawer of thy water, thou shouldest enter into covenant with the Lord thy God and into this oath which the Lord God maketh with you this day. Isaiah 56, verses 3 through 8. Neither let the son of the stranger that has joined himself to the Lord, speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuchs say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in my house and within my walls a palace and a name. Uh, when we move down, it says, it closes out by saying, The Lord God which gathereth the outcasts of Israel saith, Yet will I gather others to him beside those that I gather unto him. So we see in the Old Testament, non Israelites could join themselves to the Lord through joining themselves to the Israelites through committing to the law and the covenant of God that God gave to Israel. And we see that God prophesied through prophecy, that he would allow the stranger to enter into covenant with him. If we follow Israel's history, we'll find that they couldn't keep God's covenant, and because of their sins and disobedience, God finally divided them and sent them into captivity. But there are multiple prophecies and promises that God will make a new covenant with them, save them from their sins, and gather them back into their homeland. Uh, J Jeremiah 31 is one of the major prophecies that reveals this. But what about the salvation of the world? What about the people that were lost before Israel? Remember the covenant God made with Abraham that through that seed, which was Christ, all nations will be blessed through him. Let's go to the New Testament and see what it says about the world's salvation through Christ. John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Who did this see Jesus die for? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all to testify in due time. Hebrews 2 and 9. But we see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by grace, the grace of God, should taste death for every man. 1 John 2 and 2. And he is a propitiation for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the world. In John 1 and 29, the next day John see of Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb which take away the sins of the world. Who did Jesus ultimately send his apostles to? He sent them to the lost sheep of Israel first. But who did he ultimately send them to? Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. And he said unto them, Go ye in all, into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth is baptized shall be saved. And then, uh, since I got two minutes, we can go into Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 11, Acts chapter 13, and you'll see that uh, the apostles turned to the Gentiles, Individuals 
that uh, were, were saved were the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8 and Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, who were both non-Hebrews. And that's my closing. All right, guys, once again, you're now listening to the Bay Talk View Radio, and you're officially inside the Lions. <laughs> All right, you know that number, 646-716-7320. Later on, we're going to hear from the people out there during the public Q&A, but those that are new to the show, that's where you, the listening audience, will call in with your questions and your comments by dialing that number once again, it's 646-716-7320. Yeah, if you have a question, you got to press the number 1 and patiently stand by for the public Q&A. But right about now, we're still in the opening statement part of this debate, so let's go to the Gorilla Hebrew. Let me open up his phone line. Let me set up the timer and... Go ahead, you got 20 minutes. All right, again, first and foremost, I want to give all praise to you, Al Bashim Yahu Shine. Um, wow, uh, I feel like Vin Diesel in Fast and the Furious when he was racing Paul Walker and Paul Walker hit his nose too fast because that's what this man just did. I really am appalled that he had the nerve to go to John 3 and 16. That is ridiculous. Let's dismiss a lot of the outlandish, totally misinterpreted no understanding uh, uh, breakdowns of scriptures that he brought. He went to John 3 and 16. The word world is John 3 and 16. Real quick, for all those tuning into the live stream, let me um, let me show this so everybody in the live stream can um, get a load of it. Real quick, right here. Okay. Now, the word world there is cosmos. You've heard Hebrew Israelites going to that many times. But what does cosmos mean? The definition is an act in harmonious arrangement or constitution order government. So it's a government that it's talking about. Now, I want to go to a couple verses briefly. Um, first, Isaiah 9, and also uh, we're going to go to Isaiah 45, because Isaiah, Isaiah speaks a lot about the Savior, the Messiah, and, you know, who he was coming for and what he was going to do. So, again, remember, that word world is indicative of a government in John 3 and 16. This is Isaiah 9, 6 to 8. For unto us a child is born. Who is that child? That's Christ, right? Who the world he calls Christ? Real name Yahweh Shai. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Now the government, mind you, is going to be upon his shoulder. So this world, talked about in John 3, 16, is going to be on the shoulders of the Messiah, who the world he calls Christ. He shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts who performed this. The Lord sent a word into Jacob and it have lightened upon Israel. So it lightened upon Israel that Israel as a government would be built on the shoulders of who were ignorantly called Christ. Therefore, the world is talking about in John 3.16 is talking about Israel. Let's further prove that. This is Isaiah 45 and 17. But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Israel. It didn't say any other nation or any particular individual from outside of the nation of Israel was going to get that everlasting salvation that was promised to Israel. Ye shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without end. Israel is a world without end. Israel is the world spoken about in John 3, 16. You are out of your mind for even insinuating otherwise. You, you know, we've done that dance too much. Let's do this, though. He said, proselyte, proselyte, proselyte. I'm with you on a proselyte. Watch this. Acts 3 and 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted, right? So the proselytes were people who converted, right, into the ways of Israel. That your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So he was talking to people, encouraging them to become proselytes, right? But let's take a look at who he's talking to. Let's put this in context. Let's skip up to the 12th verse to see who Peter was addressing. This is Acts 3 and 12. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, ye men of Israel. So wait a minute. He just told men of Israel to convert into the ways of Israel. Wait a minute. What's going on here? I'll tell you what's going on here. It were the Israelites that were living in sin that had to be proselytized or Israelites that are living in Gentile state of mind that had to be proselytized back into the righteous ways of Israel in following the laws. Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us? as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk. So they were talking to fellow Israelites when they were encouraging conversion. Therefore, there were Israelites who were proselytes and converts 
back into the true, righteous, holy ways of Israel. Quit that nonsense. Then this guy goes to Exodus 12 and 48, as if he didn't read the 43rd verse. And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, this is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof, meaning no stranger shall eat of the Passover. But then in verse 48, it says, well, if a stranger circumcised, he can eat of the Passover. So is the Lord confused, or is he contradicting himself, or is he lying? What is it? I'll tell you what it is. There are various classifications of strangers. It says there as one born in the land because there were Israelites that were born outside of the land, uh, Barnabas being one of them. Barnabas was a Levite, but he was from Cyprus. He was an Israelite that was born outside of the land. So he was a stranger when he went down in Israel because he wasn't from there. Just like you might have a family member like, for example, the brother uh, Maurice lives in Texas. Right, but my ancestors and Maurice's ancestors came over here on slave ships. But when I go to Texas, if I was to go to Maurice's house, I'm a stranger there. I'm, I'm not familiar with the area, but he's still going to treat me with hospitality because I'm still his brother. I'm still the same people, if we can understand that. Now, let's go to deal with this Esther 8, this Esther 8 uh, stuff. He said, as many people became Jews. The word there is yahad, okay? And that word means to become a Jew. In fact, or fraud, become Judaized. So it's people become Judaized. Just as many Jews during the reign of Alexander the Greek and his uh, predecessor, I mean, not his predecessor, but those who came after him, we became Hellenized, which means we became Greeks. Do we become actual Greeks? No. But we be, have started following the custom of the Greeks. Let's check this out in Second Maccabees 6 and 6. Neither was it lawful for a man to keep Sabbath days or ancient feasts or profess himself at all to be a Jew. So it became illegal to profess yourself to be a Jew. They were making everybody become Greeks. Did anybody actually become actual Greeks? No. They started taking on the customs of the Greeks. Just like, yeah, I'm sure a few people did uh, partake in the customs of the Jews. But please tell me where it said they were going to obtain salvation. The question in hand here is, can a non-Israelite uh, uh, receive salvation? You cannot show me that in the scriptures. Showing me Esther 8 and 17 does not show me anybody received salvation there, especially the people who started following the ways of the Jews, okay? It's not uncommon for some great thing to happen to a certain group of people who follow a certain belief system and people to see that and want things like that to happen to themselves. Therefore, they follow that religion. We see that with several religions here um, in America. Uh, let me go to the next point, Caleb. They love to deal with this Caleb and say, Caleb wasn't an Israelite. Let's find out. It's Joshua 15 and 17. And Othaniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, took it and he gave him Akash, his daughter, to wife, right? This Kenaz. But Kenaz is really Caleb's brother, okay? Understand that. Uh, uh, now let's go to First uh, Chronicles 4 and 1. The sons of Judah, Perez, Hezron, and Carmi, and Hur, and Shobal. There's a reason I read verse 1. Because the uh, first Chronicles of fourth chapter is all dealing with the descendants of the actual person, Judah, who is a son of Israel himself. Now, you skip down to 13. What does it say? And the sons of Kenaz, Othaniel, and Sariah, and the sons of Othaniel, uh, 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 thought. Okay, so therefore, Kenaz, the Kenizzite, is listed amongst the descendants of the actual individual Judah. Therefore, Kenaz is an actual Judite pursuant to his lineage of the seed of Israel, as is Othaniel, as is Caleb. That is a weak argument that Christians have been trying to use for centuries, and it never worked, okay? Um, now he, uh, 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 I'm, you know, as far as everything else, I just want to start mounting my offense now, um, you know, because those were just very outlandish claims. I had to just shut that down briefly. Let me not take too much time away from the offense. Okay. Uh, all right. Here we go. Now let's go to the first scripture, Acts. This is New Testament love for you, Acts 5, starting at verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Verse 30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him have God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior. For to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of our sins. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given them that obey him. So it is a witness. the Holy Ghost is a witness. The Most High God is a witness. Christ himself and all the men of Israel are witnesses that Christ died for them and them exclusively. Right? Let's go to Deuteronomy 10 and 15. Let's take it all the way back to the law. Right? So we can get a foundational understanding of it. This is Daniel 10 and 15. 
Only the, I mean, not Daniel, Deuteronomy rather. Only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all people as it is this day. Deuteronomy 14 and 2. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord has chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. Deuteronomy 32, 8 to 9. When the Most High divided the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is a lot of his inheritance. If we are above all people, if he delighted only in our fathers, if he chose us to be a peculiar people unto himself, why would he give the things promised to us to anybody else? It doesn't make sense. And what you're making God's character out to be is strange. You're, you're really playing God at this point when you even insinuate that anybody outside of the nation of Israel can receive any type of salvation. Okay? Let me continue, though. This is Malachi 3 and 6. For I am the Lord. I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. The Lord doesn't change. So when we understand that the Lord told us in the law that salvation was for Israel. He told us in the law that we're above all people. He told us in the law that all the promises are made to us. So he hasn't changed that and never will change that. This have, uh, Hebrews, rather, 13, 18. Pray for us, for we trust, we have a good conscience, and all things willing to live honestly. Oh, my bad. That's not even what I need. It's 3 and 8 about uh, Jesus Christ are the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we know Christ is the same. We know the Most High is the same. They don't change. It's John 1 and 1 and 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word uh, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. We know that's a reference to Christ. So from the beginning, Christ has been there. From the beginning, the Christ has been with the Father, right? It's John 10 and 30. I am my Father, I am one. The reason why I read these verses is to establish the fact that God doesn't change and Christ doesn't change, and their mind is on one accord. Therefore, when God said salvation was only for Israel, Christ said salvation was only for Israel, it's only for Israel, and nothing can change that, okay? It is blatantly clear in the law that he is only looking to give salvation to Israel. We understand God and Christ all on that one accord, man, with them scriptures that we quoted, man. So no matter what anybody has to say, their feelings and their opinion does not change, okay? And with that being said, let's look what Christ said about the people outside of Israel. This is John 10, 5, and 6. And the stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him uh, for when they know uh, they know not the voice of strangers. Oh, my bad. I, I'm, I'm grabbing the wrong verse. That's not even what I needed. So like it, guys. Let me grab this. John 10. Just bear with me one second. I had these pasted. Matthew 10 and 5, rather. Uh, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into a city, any city of the Samaritans, into you not. So he tells the disciples not to go into the way of the Gentiles. But what Pastor uh, uh, Maurice was saying is, well, look, later they went to the Gentiles. No, the Most High in Christ do not change. Okay, when he said don't go into the way of the Gentiles, it's not to go into the way of the Gentiles. Saying that he later went to the Gentiles, meaning he changed his mind at some point. He never changed his mind. What we have to understand is the fact that there are multiple classifications of strangers in the Old Testament, and there are multiple classifications of Gentiles in the New Testament. When it's talking about Gentiles saying not going to the way of the Gentiles, that's talking about an actual flesh and blood Gentile. But we can prove the Gentiles that we are sent to in the New Testament are Israelites, and we proved it time and time again, okay? Christ is clear, though. We ain't going outside of Israel. Let's see some more candid uh, 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 quotations from Christ. Uh, concerning going outside of Israel. This is John 4 and 22. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Christ is clear there. Let's go to Acts 13 and 26. This is after the dream that Peter had with the unclean beast. And the same sentiment is being echoed throughout the entire Bible. It's only Israel. Let's see. It's Acts 13 and 26. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you fear of God, so the children of the stock of Abraham, whoever of you fear of the Most High, to you is the is the word of this salvation. That is clear. If you're not of the stock of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, salvation does not pertain to you. It is evident. Let's go to the Old Testament, Isaiah 46, 13. I bring near my righteousness. It shall not be far off. And my salvation shall not tarry, and I will place salvation in Zion 
for Israel my glory. It didn't say he was going to place salvation anywhere else. Israel is where the salvation will be placed. Zion is the glory of the Most High God. No other place and no other people. It's Isaiah 43 and 1. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. Redemption, uh, uh, redemption, salvation, it's all the same thing. They're all synonyms of one another. I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. He didn't call anybody else by their name. He called Israel by our name. For salvation. Okay? Let's go to Psalms 147, 19, 20. Now, this verse is key. He showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and judgments unto Israel. He hath not dealt so with any nation, and as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise ye the Lord. Notice, he says, the way he deals with us is unlike any other. The promises he made with us are unlike any other. So, how would any other nation receive salvation when he promised that to us? That's ridiculous. That is a, that is an insane notion, to be honest with you. Okay, let's go to Joel, though. This is Joel 2 and 27. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, not anybody else, in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. Right? This is Daniel 2 and 44. Now, that verse echoes something, that the people of Israel shall never be ashamed. Now we go to Daniel 2 and 44, and we understand what that never be ashamed means. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So the Lord is saying his kingdom shall not be left to other people. And that's what Joel is talking about in Joel 2 and 27 when it says that our people will not be ashamed because we will not be ashamed. We will be the rulers of the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven will not belong to anybody else. Giving us the kingdom of heaven is our salvation. That's what salvation is. Getting delivered from the hand of your enemies and ruling in the kingdom of heaven, which is to come, and we will not be left to anybody else. So where are the heathen or anybody outside of Israel getting salvation if that's already promised to Israel. Ain't no spots open for anybody outside the nation. Let's keep going. Let's see what happens when heathens claim to want to be a part of Israel and claim to serve the God of Israel, because I knew he was going to go there. See, they were serving the God of Israel. Well, let's see what righteous men did when these heathens came, and they said, look, we're serving your God. This is Ezra 4, starting in verse 1. Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity built the temple unto the Lord, God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Asherodon, king of Asur, which brought us up hither. So he said, they said, look, look, we've been sacrificing to your God. We want to worship your God. Just like Pastor Maurice Edwards claimed that people could get into, the, into Israel by doing so. But let's see what these righteous, holy men, Zerubbabel being the governor and, and Joshua being the high priest, or Joshua being the high priest of the time, is verse 3. And remember, in Zechariah, Joshua is, is anointed by an angel, right? But, you know, I just want to keep, you, keep that in mind, showing you that the things he did are righteous and approved of by the Most High God, this verse 3 in Ezra 4. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, Half commanded us. So these righteous men, ordained by the Most High God, Yahweh Bashem Yahweh said, Listen, you heathen, though you want to serve our God, you have nothing to do with us, and you have no business building no temple with us to our God. Let's go to Amos 9 and 11. In that day, will I raise up a tabernacle of David that is fallen? This is talking about salvation of Israel, when the tabernacle of David is raised up. And close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up. And I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old, the restoration of the kingdom of heaven, right, which is the kingdom of Israel here on earth, verse 12, that they may possess the remnant of Eden, and all of the heathen, which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. So it is talking about the salvation of Israel, and in Israel's salvation, all other nations of the earth will become captives to Israel. So how are they going to be salvation? Where is, what salvation is there of being a captive to somebody? Our people have been captives here in America. This is not a land of salvation. This is not a land of our rest. This is hell to our people. You understand what I'm saying? Now, what some people do is, well, it says, call by my name. 
Now, when you go into the Hebrew, the word my does not appear. The word there are quarasham, meaning call by name. Mayan in there. So he is calling all the heathens by name to serve Israel in the kingdom. He's calling them out. Edom, you come and serve. Ishmael, you come and serve. Moab, you come and serve. Ammon, you come and serve. Cush, you come and serve. Put, you come and serve, et cetera, et cetera, so on and so forth. All these nations of the earth are to come and to serve Israel in the kingdom. That is their duty. That is what their job is going to be, to serve Israel as captives, as bond people, okay? And that, that's all they get. Meanwhile, we obtain salvation as the nation of Israel. We get to reign in the kingdom of heaven. Again, you have yet to show me. And you, even though he tried to show, well, see, they were in Mexico, Israel, all this, he hasn't showed me anybody outside of Israel receiving salvation in the scriptures because he can't because it's not there. And with that, I'll rest. All right, guys. Once again, this is your host, Sal Showtime. You're now listening to the Bay Talk Free Radio. You know what that number is, 646-716-7320. I see we got more people joining into the show. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Uh, today's debate is entitled, Can a Non-Hebrew Be Saved? Can a Non-Hebrew Be Saved? My special guest is the Gorilla Hebrew versus Elder Maurice Edwards. So now we're going to go to the rebuttal part of this debate. That's going to be 12 minutes each. Let's go back to Elder Maurice Edwards. Let me open up his phone line, and you can go ahead, brother. Okay, first of all, in Exodus chapter 12, we have the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, okay, and the stranger is mentioned. Now, when we go into uh, Joshua and they go into the land of Canaan, uh, what God is addressing as far as strangers is if you look at, uh, I believe it's Genesis chapter 15, the first time the stranger is used, it is told to Abraham that he would be a stranger in a land. So that means that he would be a person that would be in a land that's totally from his homeland. And, he, and, and also when it says that Israel were strangers in Egypt, which does not mean one a Israelite coming from another part of the land over to a different part of the land. It means that you come directly from another country, period, and you're a different people. I provided what it means in the Hebrew. Now, Hebrew Israelites say we need to know Hebrew. A stranger is a newcomer to Israel, a foreigner, has nothing to do with one Israel. If if I'm as he made the analogy, if I'm in Texas in Irving, and I go over to Dallas, I'm not a foreigner. I'm still in the same land. So his his argument with the stranger and there's different types of strangers, that don't even make sense according to the Hebrew definition of what a foreigner is. I mean, everybody knows what a foreigner is just in general. And then with Caleb, he is the son of Jephuna. And the Kenizzite, again, are descendants of Esau. And I showed that in Genesis. And also, um, the Kenizzites are the people who are going to be over, who were, who were told to Abraham, he will overtake in the land along with the Canaanites and the other nations. So how he tried to defend Caleb of being, how could they teach that you take on the nationality of your father. If Jephunneh the Kenizzite is his father, then Caleb is a Kenizzite. Well, there's no argument there. Okay? Um, and his his definitions of salvation, there's a difference in, in Israel being saved as a nation, as David always prayed, to be saved from their enemies and to be saved from their sins. It's totally two different things. And I proved in the New Testament that Jesus died for the sins of the world. I provided several scriptures, and for him to take the word world and make it to me a government, I mean, come on. How can it be a government, it says in First John chapter uh, 2, verse 2, he's a propitiation not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. He's talking about people. He's comparing the Jews being saved as well as the rest of the world, Okay. Now, as far as salvation, uh, where the Israelites is concerned, 
the apostles were sent to the Jews first, to the, the lost sheep of Israel first. But look at all the people that Jesus blessed that were outside of Israel. Look at the Canaanite woman. Look at the Roman centurion. Why did he heal the Canaanite woman and say that and and heal the uh, centurion's servant and and said that he had more faith than his own people? He said the centurion had more faith than the children of Israel. I mean, so if he has nothing to do with if God's blessings and Jesus' blessings and healing has nothing to do with anybody else, why did he make these exceptions? And then he said God doesn't change. Well, God doesn't change in his essence, but he does change his methods in different things. He said that Moses was going to carry the people into the promised land, but because of his sin, what happened? He didn't. God made a covenant with Israel. They broke the covenant. What did it say? He will make a new covenant with them. So that's a change, right? When it, when Israel sinned and erected the golden calf, I believe it was, what did God say? Move back, Moses, and let me consume this nation and make another nation from you. Oh, but he don't change, right? What about Jesus? That he would take the kingdom away from them and give it to a, a nation that would produce fruit. So that whole thing about God don't change, you can see a bunch of changes he made and a bunch of prayers that caused God to change his mind concerning certain things. When he made man, he repented that he made man. <laughs> so to say that God don't change, that's like crazy. Um, and then in the New Testament, you're going to tell me that um, the Ethiopian eunuch that was baptized by Philip, he was, I guess he was an Israelite too, right? You're going to figure out a way to make him an Israelite. You're going to figure out a way to make um, Cornelius an Israelite. I mean, his argument, uh, it's a bunch of stuff that can be rebutted. In the Old Testament, I clearly showed, especially in Deuteronomy 29, that he would make a, that, that the covenant would be open to other nations. What about uh, the scripture that in Deuteronomy 23 when it says not to abhor a Edomite or an Egyptian? Because their third generation will be able to enter into the congregation of the Lord. So I guess he was lying about that. Uh, I guess Isaiah 19, when he said that uh, the last, uh, let, me, let me just go and get that real quick. Isaiah 19, and this is the last verse I'm going to get, because this is just very clear. Um, he says in verse 23, in that day shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrian shall come into Egypt, and the Egyptian into Assyria, and the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. In that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and with Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. I'll close with that. If you're going to tell me that God's interest is only to Israel, then the scripture says something different. God chose Israel, gave them his laws, showed his power through them, his mercy. They were supposed to be a light to the rest of the world. They failed at that. And so in the New Testament, in Ephesians chapter 3, Romans chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, uh, no, Romans chapter 16, Colossians chapter 1, and I believe it's Ephesians chapter 3, it says that the wisdom of God was not revealed to the uh, generations of old, but revealed to the church the gospel of Jesus Christ and salvation in Christ. So his total will for salvation wasn't even revealed in the Old Testament. So the Israelites of today, they think that God's plan of, of, of everything began and ends with Israel. There was a world before Israel. There was a covenant with Abraham before Israel. So that's it, brother. I, I don't even need the rest of the time. All right, my brother. Once again, you're now listening to the Bay Talk View Radio. You know that number, 646-716-7320. I see we got a lot more people pressing the number one, guys. They're pressing the number one, you know, getting ready for that public Q&A. And for those that are new to the show, the public Q&A is where you, the listening audience, will call in with your questions and your comments 
All you got to do is dial that number, 646-716-7320. Press number one and stand by patiently and wait for the public Q&A. Remember, press number one one time. Don't press it again. If you press it multiple times, it's going to either take you off the switchboard altogether or it's going to bring you at the bottom of the switchboard. So press it one time and stand by for the public Q&A. And as a matter of fact, the fourth caller, caller number four, uh, is going to receive a free official Lions Den T-shirt. I'm going to ship it out to you. All you got to do is send me an email with your mailing address, you know, your shirt size at debatetalkview at gmail.com. Once again, I'm giving away a free official Lions Den T-shirt to caller number four. So let's go to the Gorilla Heat. We'll write about down this rebuttal. Once again, it's 12 minutes each. Let me open up his phone line. Let me set up the timer and go ahead. Uh, wow. Um, this is ridiculous. I, I just want everybody to notice two things. Number one, he cannot point for point tell me that I was breaking down them scriptures wrong because they were all cut and dry and black and white. So the ultimate thing he insinuates, though he's not saying it, he is insinuating because he can't refute the scriptures that I'm bringing out as being totally, absolutely correct in pointing to salvation only being to Israel. He is insinuating that God contradicts himself. I want everybody to understand that. Um, uh, And also, um, he hasn't he, he keeps talking about this individual, that individual, or what you want to try to make them Israelites. Look, um, regardless of any of that, you have to prove to me and show me where any of those individuals obtained salvation from God, okay? And, and, and that whole deal with Cornelius, we could go deep into that, but you'll drown in those waters, frankly. Um, but I'm, um, I'm going to show you uh, how unequal. Uh, and unbalanced uh, and unfair that Pastor Maurice is. Now, peep again. I went into World World and the actual meaning of it in the Greek and showed it represents government and then hit scriptures on it. Now, watch this. I go and I show it meant government. I hit the scripture on the government. Then I said, well, look, we could even disqualify that word government and show you where Israel is referred to as a world without end. Notice he didn't address that part. But even if, let, let's just take a look at the fact that I went to the definition of world. He goes into the definition of strangers. Well, this can only mean somebody who's not an Israelite, see? Even though it doesn't say that there, he's saying that. But he's saying that I can't go into the definition of world in the Greek and say it doesn't mean the whole world, but he could do that with stranger. This dude is unfair and biased and unbalanced. And he can't be trusted because he's insinuating that the Lord contradicts himself. Um, I'm going to show you how many, like this guy, like, I'm going to show you how much of the scriptures and history he's not familiar with. He mentioned this whole thing with Caleb and the Kenizzites. Let's see, there's a man named Kenaz that came out of the line of Esau. That's true. But that's not who the Kenizzites are. Genesis 15 and 19, the Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Commonites. This is 10 chapters before Esau even exists. These were Canaanite people. So when it deals with Ken- Kenizzites, really a nation of people known as Kenizzites are actually Hamitic not Edomite. So this is how much you don't know about scriptural and biblical history. But, again, I'm going to read this one more time. This is First Chronicles 4 and 13 in the listing of the sons of Judah. Not of the sons of Esau, of the sons of Judah. You know, like, people of other nations, like, you know, they could have the same name. You know, they all come from the same language family at the end of the day. Like, you know, have you ever met a Chinese person named Tom? I have. They have the same name as a white guy and a black guy named Tom. I mean, it's not a far-fetched concept. Stop being so simple. First Chronicles 4 and 13. And the sons of Kenaz, Othaniel and Sariah, and the sons of Othaniel, uh, have, uh, have, have. So Kenaz, the Kenizzites, that family, that clan, is of the tribe of Judah, blatantly shown here in First Chronicles, the fourth chapter. Okay? Um what other madness does this guy say? Oh, save from sin. They love to say save from sin. I love that you brought that up. And he cut himself hard body. Here's how. He said he the, the, the Lord gave Israel the law. Let's go to First John 3 and 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So if he gave Israel the law, and transgression of the law is sin, how can anybody outside of Israel be saved from their sin when they can't sin because they didn't even get the law in the first place. You sound crazy. You don't know the scriptures and you daggering yourself. You talking about what daggers you got? You are cutting your, you are killing yourself in this. I'm just pointing it out. I'm pointing out how you're daggering yourself. I'm telling you. Oh look, you're bleeding. You see what you just did? You're bleeding, Pastor. Come on now. Now, uh, oh, let's let's deal with this. He said, see, they went into all nations. Tobit thirteen and three. Confess him before the Gentiles 
ye children of Israel. He's supposed to confess them to these Gentiles, right? Why? For he has scattered us among them. The only reason you need to confess the Lord to the Gentiles is because Israelites are scattered amongst all nations. It tells you in Acts, the second chapter, the fifth verse, Jews devout men out of every nation under heaven. So those are, there are Israelites dwelling amongst other groups of people and nationalities of people identifying themselves as one of them as opposed to an Israelite. And this is clearly shown in Scripture and biblical history. You not understanding that means you can't, aren't even qualified to even have a conversation about this, quite frankly. Okay, um, let me see if there was anything else. Uh Anything else I'm going to go to? I'm going to go back into these because that's pretty much it. This guy is um for for somebody who's studied so much theology, he's uh rather lightweight. Let's go to uh let's go to Isaiah 14 and 1 to 2. This is talking about what is going to occur when Israel receives salvation. Okay, Isaiah 14 1 to 2. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel, and set them in their own land. And the strangers shall be joined with them. So, yeah, you're right. There's going to be strangers joined with us, brother. And they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. They're going to cleave to us, brother. Verse 2. And the people shall take them and bring them to their place. And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids. So, yeah, there's going to be strangers with us, right, for servants and handmaids. So when we receive our salvation, they go into immediate subjection and captivity to us. They're not getting no salvation. Being a servant and a handmaid don't sound like much salvation to me. And they shall take them captives whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. Isaiah 60 and 10. And the sons of strangers, he loved them strangers, right? Let's see what the Lord said the sons of strangers are going to do. Shall build up thy walls, and their king shall minister unto thee, for in my wrath I smote thee. But in my favor have I had mercy on thee. So we are going to employ them as captives and handmaids and bond servants. That's what their job is going to be. That's what the job of the stranger is. This is Isaiah 61 and 5. And the stranger shall stand and feed your flocks. And the son of the alien shall be your plowman and your vinegar. So we're going to have them working. They're going to be working for us. Not reigning with us, working for us. This is Romans 3 and 1. What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. So unto the Israelites were committed the oracles of God. What are the oracles of God? Let's find out. Acts 7 and 38. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give us unto him. So what was received to Moses in them? During that period of time, during the Exodus and in the wilderness, that's the oracles of God. And the law, when, uh, the law is where we are promised salvation and nobody else. So the oracles of God that were committed to us are the law, and in the law, we receive salvation. Now, we are got to get salvation from our sins. We are the ones who receive the law, therefore we are the ones who made that contract. We broke the, we broke the contract, violated the contract by sinning. So we have to be saved from that. Nobody else entered into that covenant. Okay? Let's go to Leviticus 26 and 11 to 12. Let's take a look at this because this is very interesting. And I will set my tabernacle among you, talking to the Israelites, and my soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. Right? But the key point there is the tabernacle that shall be set amongst Israel. Let's go to Revelation 21, 1 to 3. Let's see the bearing that that tabernacle and the symbolism that it had in at, in retrospect to salvation that we're going to receive in Christ's second coming. Revelation 21, 1 to 3. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth will pass away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. So that ancient tabernacle we had in the time of Leviticus was symbolic of this tabernacle that we're going to receive our salvation with, or that we will be indicative of when we receive salvation, is with men. So it's men that are going to have that, be that tabernacle. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So this tabernacle is what is going to receive you know, salvation. This, this, this tabernacle is, is um, synonymous with salvation. Okay, but let's take a look at the uh, the parameters for the tabernacle. This is Numbers 1, verse 51. 
And when the tabernacle set it forward, the Levites shall take it down. And when the tabernacle is to be pitched, the Levites shall set it up. And the stranger, the stranger, and the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. So any stranger that gets near the tabernacle is to be put to death as commanded in the law of Yahweh Hashem Yahweh So please explain to me how the people who are going to be saved by Christ are going to be the tabernacle of God. And the law explicitly states that any stranger that gets near the tabernacle of God is to be put to death. So explain to me how a stranger is going to be a part of that tabernacle of salvation. You can't. It's impossible. Okay? Let's go to the next set of scriptures here. Let's go to Jeremiah 51 and 50. Read enough as many of these as possible before the time around. Jeremiah 51 and 51. We are confounded because we have heard reproach. Shame hath covered our faces. For strangers are come into the sanctuaries of the Lord's house. So he's talking about strangers coming to the sanctuary and partaking with Israel. But wait, the scriptures here in Jeremiah is saying, Bad things happened to us when strangers came into the Lord's sanctuary. Let's go to Proverbs 5 and 17. Let them be only thine own and not strangers with thee. Strangers is not supposed to be with us. Actual, literal strangers who are not of the seed of Israel. Let's go to Jeremiah 2 and 25. Withhold thy foot from being unshot and thy throat from thirst. But thou saidest, there is no hope, for I have loved strangers, and after them will I go. The scriptures are telling us, you are hopeless when you love strangers. Hopeless, right? And the seed, this is verse, this is Nehemiah 9 and 2. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and their iniquities of their father. So you must separate yourself from the strangers before you can even confess, confess your sins, to repent from your sins, to get salvation for your sins. And sins is transgressed on the law, which is given to Israel. And for the only people that can be saved from their sin are the Israelites. You see how this cycle goes? A heathen can't work himself into this cycle because the Most High has set it up that way. Okay, if he cared about the heathen, he would have blatantly said, and yes, the other nations can also receive salvation. Notice, he doesn't say that there. There is too many times that it blatantly, explicitly tells us only Israel can receive salvation. I've showed you that directly, and I've showed you that in roundabout ways as well here in the scriptures. Now, I know my time is getting, getting ready to be up, so I'll rest, and it, the rabbit hole is going to get deeper as the time goes on. Shalom. All right, guys, once again, you're officially inside the Lions, Den. It's the B Talk for you. The number is 646-716-7320. Hopefully you guys are taking down your notes because that's what this is all about. For everybody out there to hear both sides and to jot down your notes, and when you get a chance to do your own independent research, hopefully you guys are being edified by this information. Once again, it's the B Talk for you radio. So we're going to go to the cross-examination part of this debate. That's going to be 12 minutes each, and after that, we're going to take a seven-minute intermission break, and after that, we're going to have a second rebuttal that a public Q&A. I see we got a lot of people standing by waiting for that public Q&A. You know, I'm getting a lot of emails, people hitting me up, you know, Facebook, they, you know, can't wait to get inside the public Q&A. <laughs> well, we're getting there, we're getting closer and closer, guys. Uh, stand by. And uh, for those that are new, if you want to be a part of the public Q&A, the number is 646-716-7320. That's pressing number one. And patiently stand by for the public Q&A. Let your voice be heard. What do you think about this debate? Can a non-Hebrew be saved? Can a non-Hebrew be saved? What's your opinion about that? Bring it out during the public Q&A. Let your voice be heard. All right, so let's get this cross-examination started. Uh, for those that are uh, not, not not familiar with the cross-examination, each person has prepared several questions to ask one another. Of course, uh, you know, that's going to have at least two minutes. Well, the maximum amount of time to answer a question will be two minutes. And uh, once you go over the two-minute mark, you're going to hear this sound. <laughs> That means it's taking too long to answer the question, and it's time to move on to the next question. So let's get into this cross-examination. Uh, we're going to have Elder Maurice Edwards ask questions first to the Gorilla Hebrew. Let me open up their phone lines. Let me set up the timer. And Elder Maurice Edwards, you can go ahead with your question, brother. Go ahead. As it relates to uh, can a non-Hebrew be saved, why do today's Hebrew Israelites despise Esau and the Egyptians, when God said there would be a generation of these people that would enter into the congregation of the Lord, when God said not to despise Esau, for he is thy brother, and not to despise the Egyptians, for they were strangers in their land, is that a commandment or was that optional? Now, 
Number one, the term for Esau or Edom, a Edomite, in the Septuagint, which, of course, we know the t- scriptures were transliterated from the Greek Septuagint. The word there is the same word that appears for Assyrian. Why is that said about the Assyrian? Because all of our mothers were Syrian, all of Jacob's wives. Those were our close relatives. Now, even if we entertain the idea that that is about Esau, it tells us in Obadiah that he forsook the brotherly covenant. It also tells us in Malachi and Romans that God hates Esau. Okay? Um, but wait, what, what was the other part of your question? No, I don't want to get ahead of myself. What was the other part of your question so I can answer that? Wait, but you said you said that Esau. Never mind. Uh, I said, was it was it a a commandment or an option? Now you say it's, it's Assyria, but when has Assyria ever been called uh, Israel's mother? Well, because those are really, all our all of our mothers were Syrians. They're Hebrew people. We were I, even on. the Egypt. When you go on the walls of Kemet. It talks about Israel acts as Syrians during certain parts of antiquity before we were established as a nation. Everywhere in the King James Bible that it says Esau or Edom, that's what it means, brother. I don't know where you're getting that from, but anyway, listen, I'll listen. go to the next. You're question. not you're not a, you're not a scholar in linguistics, so I, I can't I can't go with that with what you're saying. Yeah, I, have but the in the, I have to prove in the I can show James prove Bible, though, right now. Listen, in the was King the Bible, James Bible was the original text of the scriptures written? in the King James Bible, in the King's English in 1611, or did it possibly appear before that time? Do you use the King James oh, Bible? Save your questions, brother. Save your questions. Save your questions, Elazar. Okay. Go ahead, uh, go ahead, go ahead Ellen Maurice. Go ahead. All right. Uh, in the New Testament, Jesus sent his disciples to the lost sheep of Israel first. Correct. Uh, but before I'm he ascended first. into heaven... To the lost sheep of Israel. Right. Well, in Acts it says that he sent them to his own people first, but since they counted themselves unworthy of uh, eternal life, they turned to the Gentiles. But anyway, uh, before he ascended into heaven, he commanded them to teach all nations in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. And then in Mark chapter 16, he commands them to preach the gospel to every creature. If salvation was only to the Israelites, why would Jesus command them to do this? That's actually great questions. Number one, all nations, we've already covered that. Let's cover that one more time because Yoda Maurice may be hard to hear. Uh, and cover, cover to every creature, too. All right, I'm, don't worry. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. All right, so Israelites lived in every nation, so preach to every nation. That's why. Tobit 13 and 3. What scripture you said that was? That was Acts 2 and 5. Now, uh, Tobit 13 and 3. Confess him before the Gentiles, ye children of Israel, for he has scattered us among them. Okay, now let me. You know, in Acts chapter 2, was more people there than just Jews and Israelites. You know, I can show you that. It, li- it lists all the people who were there by their nationality. It said you read Jews, the whole thing. It, it, Listen, listen, it's to the, from five is where the context begins. It said Jews devout nation, out of every nation under heaven, and then it listed every nation in which the Jews came out of. Are you, I mean, I don't understand, like, are you not understanding what's going on there? That's, I mean, that's clear. Um, now, uh, when we deal with every creature, when we go here into second Ezra, you have to observe something. The second Ezra, I'm going to start at 8 and 20, because this is a very deep uh, a question you asked, and I've done very deep study on it. I just want to uh, 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 let you know that. I only got two minutes to answer, so I'm going to try to give you the hot pocket answer, but I suggest everybody go watch the um, the videos I have on my channel, Sakari1715, called Understanding Acts the 10th Chapter. But uh, I'm going to start at Second Ezra 8 and 29. Let it not be thy will to destroy them which have lived like beasts, and to look upon them that have, uh, that have clearly taught thy law. So it says, let not uh, thy will be to destroy them that have lived like beasts. In this chapter, which, again, I only have a short amount of time, so I can't go into all this chapter, but in this chapter, Israel is referred to as the Lord's beasts and creatures. So you understand when the word creatures show up and beasts show up in chapters like in Acts the 10th chapter, especially when you go into this chapter, among other chapters in the Bible, if you're not a fan of the Apocrypha, in the Bible as well, it becomes clear the Lord's beasts and creatures. Wow. Next question. Okay. Next question. 
uh, in Romans 11, did Paul say that Israel's fall? Uh, in Romans 11 and 12, did Paul say that, that Israel's fall is the salvation of the world? If so, how can Israel be the world the scripture is talking about in John 3.16? Because it says that Israel's fall was the salvation of the world. So how can they do uh, both? What what translation are you reading? Because it it doesn't say that Israel's fall is the salvation. It said, now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fall? It didn't say that their fall is the salvation of the world. It, it says the rich. If you look at that whole chapter, come on, man. If you look at the whole chapter of Romans 11, it talks about, the fall of Israel and the grafting in of the Gentiles. And he uh, he said that their fall was the salvation of the world and that God would provoke Israel to jealousy with another nation. Is that, that chapter, so you're going to tell me that chapter is not saying that? No, and not in anybody of an actual other nation, no. Okay, so he so God provoked Israel with Israel, with their own, their own people. Is that what you're saying? Yes, with the Israelites who were Hellenized and began to, when you take a look at the term Greek, for example, several times used in the New Testament, it says Hellenized, Greek-speaking, Greek lifestyle-living Jews. So it's talking about those of the nation of Israel that fell away from the customs of their forefather and began to follow the ways of the heathen. This is something that is historically documented. It's called the Hellenized, the Hellenized period. It's not... You know what I'm saying? It's not like uh, something that's a secret. This is very well established amongst people who are uh, familiar with biblical history and Le- and the history of the Levant in general. That's that's the end of my question. All right, Gorilla Hebrew, you can ask your questions to Elder Maurice Edwards. Go ahead. Elder Maurice, you mentioned the grafting in which is a very interesting concept, my brother. Um, are you familiar at all with any sort of farming techniques? I know you're from the country. I don't know how country you is, but are you familiar with any type of farming techniques? Yeah, I already know where you're going with it. Go ahead. Okay, well, can you please explain to me how a, a, any fruit can be grafted into another fruit? Is that possible? It says about, it says that they were grafted into the root. Okay, but that, that has nothing to do if, with that if, has nothing to do if, with if agriculture. Two, no, if it, it, it is because it is an agriculture an agricultural analogy. You telling me that the Most High God is making an analogy of something that He made physically impossible? No, that's the whole purpose He made the analogy because it's something that is easily observable. So, can you show me where an apple is grafted into an orange tree? Can you show me where a person can walk on water? See, now what you're doing is playing a game. I'm not playing games. I'm just telling you that now why would they use analogies listen, that you can't prove just, with science and biology? That's my point. Okay, listen. What, what, what analogy, show me an analogy that hasn't been, that can't be proven by science or biology. Analogies, listen, the purpose for analogies is to show you a practical, a practical example of something that might not be so practical so you can get a better understanding of it. So why would the most high try to be illustrating something to somebody to make them understand it, but make them, but give them an analogy that is something beyond their realm of understanding. That just doesn't make sense. The the realm of understanding was he told them that the natural branches was cut off and then the wild branches was grafted in. And he told them not to boast in that, that he can graft in the natural branches again, if they remain not in unbelief, which he was talking about. But, but, But it's all of the same fruit though. It's all of the same fruit. You cannot grab, a different fruit into a tree of the same fruit. You just can't do it. Okay, well, when you read the whole chapter of uh, Romans chapter 11, I think that it's, it's, it's very clear that Israel was being uh, provoked or and, and uh, provoked to jealousy with another nation. It, I mean, well, you, you can read well, through it and see it. Well, well, I think you don't have understanding. Let me move to my next question. Um, you said, again, which I covered this, but I just have to ask you it now. You said that these other people are going to be saved from sin. What is sin, Elder Maurice? Sin is a blatant disobedience against God's will, and it's also missing the mark. That's what 
the great one, said, one. is missing. The, number all one. have sinned, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what Romans 3 and 23 says. All right. All right. Well, it's funny. He said it's resisting. It's resisting the will. Let's go to Romans 9 and 19. This guy doesn't know the Bible. Though, uh, thou wilt say unto me, why doth he yet find fault? Who hath resisted his will? No people have resisted the will of God, so that's impossible. As already read in 1 John 3 and 4, sin is transgression of the law. Okay, Who so what law, that, what law did reason? Adam sin? When I, if, if the scripture in Romans says that sin entered in the world through Adam, then what, what law did he break? Number one, if when you understand in the scriptures this, the law existed even before it was given to Moses, it was put in stone. Come on, we're talking removed. about a mosaic law and a law that's established. Those are not the same things. The law that Israel was given was a law that brought about their covenant. So come on, don't try to. Let's, uh, let's go. Let's go count. to the book of First John. Let's go to First John three and four briefly, and let's see the law that is being referred to here uh, as in reference to the doctrinal definition. Of sin, because mm-hmm. it said concerning Adam that where there was no law, that they couldn't impute sin to Adam. You remember that? Okay, and you can't right. impute sin to anybody where there is no law, and we know that what is the law that is go- that okay, is governing. Then. So sin. then that means Adam didn't sin against against uh, the law in the same way that Israel did. That's obvious. That's obvious. What, okay, yep. so what sin did Adam commit? Actually, it was uh, Eve that was deceived. It was a commandment. Okay, but Adam still sinned. It wasn't a law. It wasn't a law that was given to Israel. That's clear. Okay, so what was the sin of Adam? Do you even know? What do you mean, what was the sin of Adam? What was the sin of Adam? What did Adam do that sin? Sin entered into the world uh, through Adam. You just said it. Now, what was Adam's sin? Eve, Eve was deceived, and Adam... Adam, we know that uh, consented, what Adam, Adam consented that to that as well. Really, he disobeyed. He disobeyed his commandment as well by being deceived through Eve. Oh, he disobeyed his commandment. So, how did he disobey the commandment, though? Do you know? If you explain it to me. Okay. What are the trees of the field, my brother? Do you know? The trees of what? The field that it's referring to. The tree. When you when you deal with trees, in he said the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. That's what he said. Okay, no, well, all right, you're saying that, but it, that's a metaphor. It's not a literal tree. What are what is the metaphysical meaning of trees in the scriptures? I don't I don't actually know that. Metaphysically, trees see you do know that, but you you just don't realize you know that. For example, the the grafting in concept. Trees all throughout the scriptures are metaphors for nations of people. For example, the cedar of Lebanon, the uh, the twig that branch was higher than everybody else's in Ezekiel, the grafting in, okay, and and whatever. Okay, the big tree. That's I got they, you. So what basically Adam did was follow after a philosophy or religion or what, what so have you of another nation, the same type of sin that is condemned in the Levitical law. So what I'm saying is we know God does not change. So we understand he's had these same commandments that he gave to the chosen of his people who ultimately became the Israelites always. It's all the same seed as far as his chosen. And always they always had the law. What I'm saying is transgression of the law is sin. The law was given to Israel. So how can anybody be saved from sin outside of Israel? You, I mean, can you explain that? You said, okay, ask that question again. Okay. Sin is transgression of the law. The law was given to Israel. How can anybody else be saved from their sin when sin truthfully pertains to Israel? Okay, because there because the world was condemned in sin before Israel. And Israel being saved from their own law and the world being saved is two different things. All right. Well you say so that's fine. Now can you show me an example? So, you, so are you going to tell me there wasn't listen, sin listen, in the world before, listen, listen, before uh, me, Israel? Listen, I, I moved on from that question. It's not your okay. question and answer time. Now, okay. now, here's my question. Can you show me somebody outside of Israel blatantly receiving, or the scriptures blatantly say that that individual received salvation, as in the ultimate yeah. salvation? 
The Ethiopian eunuch was baptized. And you, I you said, weren't baptized. Lately you, said weren't, you weren't received, received salvation. Nobody's received salvation yet, not even Israel. It's yet to come. So how can, there, how can you, therefore, anybody say that? Therefore, therefore, how could you even formulate the thesis that a non-Israelite could be saved if nobody even received salvation yet? You don't even know who's going to receive salvation. Because, how could you formulate because, that thesis? Because it said, because uh, Jesus said, he who believes in him shall be saved, meaning future. And there's plenty of people that believed in Christ that were not Hebrew. Oh, that's that's your final answer. And that's not will you tell me? Now, will you tell me that that's not the truth? I can show you several people who believe in Christ. In, in and I've showed you, I've, I've had, showed you several verses. And have more faith, and have more faith than Israel did. One at a time. I Jesus, you several, Jesus I show, said it. One at a time. I've showed though. you several. I've showed you several verses where statements like that were always being made to the people of Israel. And I could, I've could i already proven to you, and I could go even further in depth in historical context to how several Israelites went off into the ways of the nation, of the other people. For example, the woman in John 4.22, John the fourth chapter, identified herself as an Israelite, though she was technically being national, uh, nationwide identified as a Canaanite. But you have no understanding. It's biblical, scriptural, history, or context, and that's your problem. But with that, I have no more questions. All right, guys, we are back. We got more debate for you guys. Once again, welcome to Debate Talk for you, and you're officially inside the lion's den. That's right, guys. We got much more debate for you guys. So I see people pressing at number one. Waiting for that public Q&A, guys. And right there, that's my favorite part of the show. I like to hear from the people out there. And right after the second rebuttal, guys, we're going to go to you guys for the public Q&A. So you can press the number one to call in right now and press the number one and stand by. And uh, say your name, guys, where you're from, and get into your questions. Of course, you know, we got to have limited limited time because we have a lot of people that want to ask questions, guys. So make sure you keep your questions and comments brief. But uh, let's get the second rebuttal started right about now. For those that are just that's joining into the show, welcome to the show, guys. Today's show is entitled, Can a Non-Hebrew Be Saved? Can a Non-Hebrew Be Saved? And if you missed any part of the show, this show is archived. All you got to do is go to the website, www.blogtalkradio.com, slash debate talk for you, and click on this debate, Can a Non-Hebrew Be Saved? And as a matter of fact, you can even download the show. Once you click on the link, Below the visual screen on the left-hand side, you're going to see a little link that says download. And I appreciate all your support, guys, out there for the Bay Talk for you. And uh, my special guest, if you want to reach out to my special guest that's on the show right now, uh, you can go to the description box. I have their YouTube pages, their emails, and all of that information. So if you need some further, you know, questions, if you have further questions or you want to ask them any more, uh, you know, get some more information, you can email the brothers. And my special guest is the Gorilla Hebrew and Elder Maurice Edwards. So let's get the second rebuttal started. It's going to be seven minutes each. We're going to go to Elder Maurice Edwards with a second rebuttal. Let me open up his phone line. And, brother, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, I wasn't prepared for a second rebuttal. I'm, I was looking on Facebook uh, where you sent me the format. It says intermission seven minutes, and then it goes right to 35 minutes of uh, Q&A. Where, do you, where oh, do you have the second rebuttal? I don't see that. Um, I must have made a typo then. We usually have the second rebuttals on the show. Okay. So, well, okay. Well, well I can that. come up with something real. I, I can it. come up with something <laughs> real quick. But uh, I yeah, but I, I can I can send it to you. I'm not I'm not uh, uh trying to get out of it. It says seven minutes yeah, yeah. intermission. Then for Q and A thirty five. That's cool. Um, let me see. What can I? Uh, we just got out of court. We just got out of cross examination. So. What were we uh, talking about there? Um, I guess I can go back into uh, the Old Testament, and um, he says that a stranger could not join themselves to uh, the Israelites. And see, here's my rebuttal for him where the Old Testament is concerned. Um Salvation in the Old Testament, and in the perspective that I see in the Bible, is either you were God's people, 
you were of the congregation of the Lord or you weren't. You were either God's people or you were his enemies. Even when it came to Israel and Hosea, those who fell into uh, sin, he even told some of them, you are not my people and I will not have mercy on you. And he named, he had uh, Hosea name two of his children that uh, that meant, I forgot the names, Loami or something like that, that meant no mercy and you're not my people. And so when it comes to salvation in the Old Testament, for Israel to be called as a chosen people and given his laws, uh, to say that other people could not join uh, the Israelites is to deny uh, scriptures such as Deuteronomy 29. And when it talks about entering into covenant with him, he mentions salvation, like nobody's been saved. Well, salvation is a, a, a prophetic work that has not been completed yet. So uh, in theology, many theologians will say we were saved from our sins, we're being saved and shall be saved. Because it's clear that salvation through Jesus Christ was that he saved the world from the penalty of sin. We were all destined to be judged for, uh, because of our sin, not just not just Israel. So my rebuttal for him is in, say, Deuteronomy chapter 23 and Deuteronomy chapter 29, I believe it, it clearly says that the, that there is a particular generation, the third generation of of Esau and the Egyptians will be able to enter into the congregation of the Lord. Before that, it says that the, the Moabites and another nation, let me see if I can pull it up real quick, uh, on the contrary, cannot enter into covenant. So, and let me just pull that up real quick. Uh, yeah, Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 3. An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to their tenth generation shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. But then when you go down to uh, verse 7, which uh, today's Hebrew Israelites totally uh, sin against this commandment. It says, Thou should not abhor an Edomite, for he is thy brother. And he called, and uh, the Hebrew said that uh, this is talking about Assyrians. But it says Edomite here. Wow. Okay, for he is thy brother. Thou should not abhor an Egyptian, because thou wast a stranger in his land. The children that are begotten of them shall enter into the congregation of the Lord in their third generation. So, again, if we're talking about salvation in the Old Testament, either you were God's people or you weren't, then uh, this is surely saying that they could be God's people and a part of their congregation. Uh, I think that says I'm saying I've got two minutes left. So let me go to Deuteronomy chapter 29 and see if I can find... Uh, where it says, yeah, Deuteronomy 29. Then men shall say, because thou hast forsaken the covenant of the Lord thy God, for they went and served other gods, and the anger of the Lord was kindled. Where am I, where, am I, where is that at? I'm sorry, it's 10 and 15. Yeah, and 13, that he may establish thee today a people unto himself, that they may be unto thee a God, as he has said unto thee, as he has sworn his fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Neither with you only do I make this covenant and this oath, but with him that standeth here with us today before the Lord, and also with him that is not here with us this day. I'm sorry, y'all. I had to find that real quick on the fly. Um, 
verse 12, it says, Thou shouldest enter into covenant with the Lord thy God and unto his oath which the Lord maketh this day. This is talking about not only Israel, but also the stranger. In verse 11, it says, Your little ones, your wives, and thy stranger that is in thy camp, from the hewer of wood unto the draw of thy water. So, All right, once again, the number is 646-716-7320. You're now listening to Debate Talk for you. So we're still in the second rebuttal part of this debate, and uh, once again, uh, Elder Maurice Edwards, I apologize if I uh, was didn't send you that information about the second rebuttal, but I'm glad you still happen to uh, bring out some more information and uh, fill in that slide, because I was going to ask you, for the sake of fairness, I was going to move on and uh, just go straight into the public Q&A. But once again, I appreciate you for uh, you know using, utilizing those seven minutes, and uh, we're going to go to the Gorilla Hebrew right Right now, but his second rebuttal, and after that, guys, we're going to go to you, the people out there. I know you guys are waiting patiently, so after this, we're going to go to you, the people out there, and uh, see what you guys got to say about this debate. And once again, you know that number, 646-716-7320. It's pressing number one, and I'll add you in the conversation. And uh, caller number four, the fourth caller that I'll open up the phone lines to, will receive a free official Lions Den T-shirt. So, you know, once again, I appreciate everybody that's calling in for Debate Talk for You. And all you got to do is send me an email at debatetalkforyou at gmail.com uh, for the fourth caller. Leave me a mailing address and your shirt size and all of that good stuff. So, let's go to the second rebuttal. Let's go to the Gorilla Hebrew. And uh, you can go ahead, brother. Seven minutes. Yeah, uh, a big shout out to, uh, for, for, for past, to Pastor Mo for, you know, being a trooper with that whole situation. Um, definitely. Uh well, I want to I want to take a look at it at Deuteronomy 23. Um, you know, because I I've actually been meaning to address that. Uh, but you know, because everything else it kind of slipped. What we have to understand again, like I like I was stressing to him, is the Hebrew language. We have to understand the Hebrew language. When you take a word, look at the word for begotten there in Deuteronomy 23, as in reference to the children of Edomites and Egyptians. We have to understand the masculine and the feminine uh, uh, types of words in the Hebrew. The word there is a uh, Yalad H3205. Uh, and that word is a feminine form of begetting, symbolic of the women of Edom and the women of uh of uh of uh, Egypt as opposed to the actual um as opposed to the actual men. The women's children who could possibly have been actually of the seed of Israel as opposed to the actual children of the Edomites and the Egyptians. So I just wanted to uh, point that out. Um, uh, and then he and then he went to do around me about those that are not here with us. I mean that clearly means that generations of Israelites to come. That's clear. Um, let's go to Galatians four and four. Uh, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, which we know is uh, who the world is called is Christ. Yahweh Shai, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that might receive the adoption of sons. So the adoption of sons, the adoption, the grafting in. The redemption and salvation, it's clearly in the Old and New Testament only in pursuant to Israel. It only pertains to Israel, okay? Now I'm going to go back into the regular schedule program. Hold on. Get this up there so everybody can see. Okay, um, I left off here. The second Maccabees 6, starting in verse 1. Not long after this time, the king sent an old man of Athens to compel the Jews to depart from the laws of their fathers and to not live after the laws of God and to pollute also the temple in Jerusalem, and to call it the temple of Jupiter Olympius, and that in Gerizim of Jupiter, the defender of strangers, as they did desire that dwell in the place. The coming in of this mischief was sore and grievous to the people. So what happened is we were forced to worship Jupiter Olympius, the defender of strangers. Right? So let's go into what that means and what that concept is, because that's a Greek pagan god. Worshiping a Greek pagan god, that's where that whole concept of this loving the stranger is. So when you hear these brothers stress that we got to love these strangers, we got to accept them, what they're really doing is worshiping Zeus, and I'm going to prove it. And we were forced into worshiping Zeus, and some of these same brothers are the ones that was worshiping Zeus back in the ancient times. Let's go to it. It's called Exenia. Okay, the Greek god Zeus is sometimes called group Zeus Exenios. In his role as a, a protector of strangers. So this is not the Most High God of Israel. His role is not the protector of strangers. This is Zeus, a pagan god that we were forced into worshiping, that was against everything that the Lord had laid for us. 
He thus embodied the religious obligation to be hospitable to strangers. The Oxen or Theathea is a theme in Greek mythology in which humans demonstrate their virtue or piety by extending hospitality to a humble stranger who turns out to be a disguised deity. They don't realize in this whole stranger thing what they're doing is being zealous for a pagan religion with the capacity to bestow rewards, and it's all to get a reward. That's what it's all about. It's really a ritual of, you know, the Zeus cult. These stories caution mortals that any guest should be treated as if potentially a disguised divinity and help establish the idea of Xenia as a fundamental Greek custom. The term Deoxian, Foxenia, rather, also covered entertaining among the gods themselves, a popular subject in classical art, which was revived at the Renaissance in works depicting a feast of the gods. And that was the, uh, a scholastic a book known as Homer's Odyssey and the Near East, an analysis of Greek cultures, traditions, and cults. So really what brothers is doing when they get so zealous for the love of the stranger is truthfully worshiping Zeus and practicing in the Zeus cult. Because we've already read several times about the Lord's the same for the strangers, and we're going to further read about it. Let's go to Exodus uh, 12 and 43, which I already brought out. And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat there of the Lord. Does not want the strangers eating at the Passover. The strangers that can't eat at the Passover, again, are Israelites that were born outside of Israel. That's why it says, in the land, is about to say. But uh, the verse I'm going to get ready to read, rather. But an uh, uh, Israelite that's born outside of Israel that comes into Israel to keep the feast. Again, I mentioned Barnabas the Levite from Cyprus. Now let's go to Leviticus 22:25. Neither from a stranger's hand shall he offer the bread neither from a stranger's hand shall he offer the bread of your God of any of these because their corruption is in them. So the strangers are corrupt and they cannot offer the bread of God and blemishes be in them. They shall not be accepted for you. Now watch this. This is talking about the bread of God. Now the bread of God cannot be accepted or eaten by a stranger as it laid out to us in the law in Exodus and Leviticus. Now watch this. Watch what Christ said. Watch what Yahweh Shah said in Luke 14 and 15. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat, in the, in, uh, eat bread in the kingdom of God. So eat that bread of the kingdom of God, which is that symbolic bread of God, right? So Yahweh Shah, who the world only calls Christ, stressed this bread, the same bread that a heathen is, is uh, not permitted to eat of pursuant to the law, right? So only those have eaten from the bread from the beginning, are, are allowed to eat the bread in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, now I'm going to get these couple of scriptures before uh, time runs out. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144 and 4,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Let's skip up to verse 10. And cry with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. So what was that read to, so, to show? that those sealed are the Israelites and the salvation is pursuant to the elect, the Israelites. That's clear in the Old and New Testament. With that, we can go into the public Q&A. All right, guys, this is it. This is the public Q&A. This is the moment of truth, guys. Uh, do you agree with this particular topic? Can a non will be saved? This is your time to let your voice be heard. You know that number, 646-716-7320. All you got to do is press the number one, and I'll add you in the conversation. You're going to hear from the people, guys. And this is for those people that are new to the show, some of the rules for the public Q&A, there's no foul language, guys. No foul language, or else you'll be officially blocked from the show. And, of course, due to the high volume of callers, I'm going to ask everybody to keep their comments as brief as possible, or the questions as brief as possible, uh, unless I feel some of the information that's being brought out is edifying for the people. I may let you, you know, talk a little while longer, but for the most part, let's keep it as brief, brief as possible. And show respect to the special guests, as well as special guests, show respect to the listening audience out there. So let's go to the people. Let's see what they got to say. And like I said, the caller number four will receive an official Lion's Den T-shirt. I appreciate you for tuning in to the Bay Talk for you. Let's go to the people. Let's see what they got to say. First one up, let's go to 484-632. You're live on the Bay Talk for you radio. Four eight four six three two. You live in air. Going once. Uh oh, going Slow, twice. Slow. I'm sorry. I had a, I had a meeting. <laughs> sorry. How you doing, my brother? Welcome to the show. All right. I'm doing good. Um, you know what? I don't even know what to say. I, I listen to everything that everybody had to say. I don't agree, honestly. Um, <clears throat> with a lot of things that that um, both the brothers said. 
there's some good points that they made. I think there's a lot of scripture that they left out. Um, Genesis 18 is a great is a great scripture that you both left out that y'all should have both used honestly. Um, I think the precedence on what you're asking is really <clears throat> excuse me irrelevant if you don't understand the concept of what salvation is. And neither one of y'all touched on the concept of what salvation is. So how can you um, actually like um, um, the brother elder um, made a good point that um, both of you, that um, um, brother um, Gorilla Hebrew, y- y- y'all both actually touched on it, and I think that the best point of the whole thing was that you don't know who can gain salvation, actually, because the Bible doesn't tell you who gains salvation. If you go to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, it says that um, Yeshua was made the author of salvation because of one thing that he can did, and, um, and that's obedience. Obedience is the key to salvation, so if you can't be obedient, you can't gain salvation anyway. And that's proven through um, Luke chapter 22, verses 42, where it says that his act of obedience, which was his um, willingness to say, nevertheless, you know, that will be done, Lord, whatever it, could be, whatever it may be. You know, I'm not a scripture quoter. Even though I know them all, I'm not going to quote 50,000 scriptures. Because the person who quotes so many scriptures, like King Solomon said, you may have a lot of knowledge, but you lack understanding and you lack wisdom. And it, like it states, you know, even later on in chapter 6 of Hebrews, chapter um, of Hebrews, it, you know, it tells you the reasons on why. I mean, those are the basics of salvation right there. And you can't rightfully say who's going to gain salvation regardless of whatever. I think that, you know, Brother um, um, Hebrews, you know, you made a lot of good points on, you know, the premises on why Israel was given the, as considered being the first son of salvation unto you know and unto um the Lord God himself. But then also, you know, there's other instances in the scripture where it does state, you know, there's plenty of them, like um Brother Elder was trying to say, state to you, you know, that, you know, the Lord has because of this of the um um disobedience of Israel has, you know, outright called other nations, you know, to you know, to um like he said, um Cause him to be jealous, you know. Even um, in Isaiah seventeen and fourteen, where it says that he will call. All right, hold on, my brother. Let's go to Gorilla Hebrew because you know we got a lot of people here standing by. Gorilla Hebrew, you want to respond to that? Go ahead. Yeah, he makes a good point as far as obedience, and it, it just calls to mind a scripture. And here's the thing, you know, they'll point out instances here and there, but like, what the, the issue is, all the, the scriptures that you bring do not negate the scriptures that I bring, and the understanding that I'm giving contextualizes the scripture that you're giving, and that doesn't happen and vice versa. So what you're either doing is saying, well, my scriptures outweigh your scriptures, or uh, uh, my scriptures negate your scriptures, or you're just blatantly admitting to you don't have the understanding, or, or you're trying to say that the Bible contradicts itself. And, and no. you got to remember that. Okay, but let me read this this uh, this, this verse. This second like Ezra 3 and 36, regarding to the obedience that he spoke of. Um, Thou shalt find that Israel by name have kept thy precepts, but not the heathen. So though there were many disobedient people of Israel, ultimately Israel as a nation is the only group of people who ever kept the precepts and were ever truly obedient to the Most High God. The term obedient in itself etymologically goes back to the Hebrew word ibad, which means servant, and Israel is known as the Lord's servants. Therefore, Israel is the only people that ever were truly obedient to the most high God, therefore, according to his qualifications, the only people eligible for salvation. Well, then I would have to say it like this, then, um, brother, that I would have to, that I would have to um, disagree. You know what I mean? And we would have to, you have to understand why. Noah was not a Hebrew. He was, he was not disobedient. Abraham was not an Israelite. And he was not. My brother. My brother. My brother. I my brother. Can understand I understand what I'm saying. I understand what you're I, saying I in what the context saying. of the Please. law. Understand what I'm saying first, first brother. Could you... Yeah, hold on, my brother. We gotta ask the, uh, we gotta get a response for the uh, Gorilla Hebrew quickly. Then we gotta go to Elder Maurice get his response. Go ahead. I pre-qualified those outlandish claims. What that is is what we call a, a cherry picking. Short people try to shortcut. Abraham wasn't a, was an Israelite. No, it wasn't an Israelite. Israel didn't exist at that period in time. They were literally the equivalent to what an Israelite is today during their time period because they were the people in which who the Lord God had chosen. So that. That's a scapegoat and that's a cop-out. 
they are the equivalent to Israel. So you can't sit there and separate them from Israel when they are literally the progenitors of Israel. So, you know, that's just, you know, that's just weak, and people do that when they don't have any other place to go. But go ahead. Uh, Elder Maurice, you want to respond? Go ahead. You can reply. Uh, I think that if we had an hour to teach, I'm sure that myself and the Guerrilla Hebrew could thoroughly um, give the totality of salvation. But I think in the Old Testament, um, in that second rebuttal, I think I clearly stated that salvation in the Old Testament was becoming the people of God. Either you were the people of God or you were his, his enemy. And in the New Testament, I think I clearly showed that it's to be say, actually saved from your sins. And uh, we can know who will be saved because Jesus said in Mark 16, um, he that, 16 and 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And then in Romans chapter 10, it says, uh, verse 9, that if you confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So we know that belief in, we, we can know who will be saved based on what the scripture says. If you believe in him, you shall be saved, John 3.16. Whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, do we know who believes and do we know who will persevere? Uh, Jesus also says he who endures to the end shall be saved. Do we know who's going to persevere and, and uh, endure to the end? Do we know who's going to believe? No. But we don't, do know the way of salvation, and that is belief in Christ. And we do know in the Old Testament that keeping the uh, covenant is how you uh, would consider, consider the uh, people of God. And if you didn't, even many Israelites will cut off. So I, I think we can. We can know based on those scriptures. Okay, bro. All right, so let's go to the next person. Once again, you know that number, 646-716-7320. This is your time, guys. You know, make sure your peace or forever hold your peace. You know that number, 646-716-7320. Let's press number one. Let your voice be heard. Uh, can a non-Hebrew be saved? Can a non-Hebrew be saved? This is the public Q&A time. So let's go to the people. Let's see what they got to say. Let's go to the next person, 314-680. You're live on the Bay Talk for you. What's up? What's up? This is Leron Camel Peace to everybody in the house. What's up, Elazar? What's up, uh, Pastor? What's going on with you? Good peace, my brother. Yeah, so long, yeah, brother. yeah. I, I, I uh. Elazar, that's my brother, but he know I disagree with him on that. What he talking about? But uh, uh, Pastor man, you um, uh, you got the right scriptures, man. But you just need to speak with a little bit more authority, man, behind what you're saying, man. This is this is you handling the word of God here, man. And when you're handling the word of God, you got to handle it with a little bit more authority. Jesus spoke with authority, and you need to speak a little bit more with authority, you know, and um. Uh, and uh, you know when you when you're dealing with these scriptures, but I don't know if you brought this scripture out, but I want to bring this scripture out. Uh, I want to go to Acts. Um, um, let's deal with Acts 13. Actually, I want to deal with that. Uh, Acts 13 and 45. And uh, I dealt with Acts, Acts 13 and 46. But go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's that's basically the same thing. But I want to show you. I don't know. Did you deal with Isaiah 49 and 6 also? No, I didn't. Okay, yeah, because that's that. You you deal with that scripture. You got to go back to that one too. Uh, okay. It says thirteen and forty five. It says, but when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against the things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. It says, right. then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should first be spoken to you. To but seeing you put it from you and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, underline everlasting life. It says, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So when you underline everlasting life, number one is Paul is speaking this because there is a scripture that is behind this, uh, uh, that the scripture uh, is behind this for. It says 47 says, for 
For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Of the earth. So we, yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah. So when you when you underline everlasting life and you deal with salvation, there you get your definition. But, okay, let's go to the scriptures that Paul referred us to, and let's see who Paul was actually talking to. Isaiah 49 and 6. And, and, and understand this, you can, to be a, to a Jew, when you were a Jew, whether you was the north or, or, the, or, the, or the southern uh, Israel, you were also called a Jew also. They called them both the same right. thing because it was the Jewish right. religion. And that's in the scripture. Let's go to Isaiah 49 and 6, and let's see who Paul was talking to. 49 and 6. Okay, now I want to ask Eleazar these, these questions. It says, and he said, it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob. Uh, Eleazar, who was the tribes of Jacob? You going to ask me a redundant question like that? Uh, who were the tribes of Jacob? Go ahead, brother. Both tribes of Israel. Okay, now watch this. Now watch, now watch this. And to restore the preserves of Israel. Do you know who the preserves of Israel is, Eleazar? The elect. I'm sorry? The elect. The elect, right? Now, watch this. Watch this. I will also, underline also in there. He said, I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation, underline that, unto the ends of the earth. So this is the scripture that Paul was referring to. And so watch this. Watch this. Check this out. Okay, if you have the 12 tribes of Israel, and then you have also the elect out of Israel, which is the uh, the 144,000, the preserved, preserved of Israel, then you must deal with the also. Underline the also, sisters and brothers, because the also tells you the outside of Israel is the also. And this refers to the scripture when he told Abraham, when he brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans, he said, he said, and I, he said, and through thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Well, I brought that out in the beginning. Uh, okay, hold on, hold on, brother. Sisters and brothers, do you not understand what God brought, it, when he brought Israel, when he brought Abraham up out of Ur of the Chaldeans, that he had the non-Israelites on his mind as well to bring them back into the most High God, purpose of bringing him out of Ur of the Chaldeans. When you see, when you look at uh, uh, the Tower of Babel, when he knew he could re relate his man as a whole no more, so he brought them, uh, Abraham out of the Ur of the Chaldeans to bring men back unto him. That was the first thing he expressed to Abraham was. So, sisters and brothers, when you. Yeah, hold on, let me that, uh, <laughs> really, you will respond, my brother. Go ahead, really, you can respond. Yeah, it's fun. I, I really, I love it when Christians do this. Like, I love it so much. Like, y'all clearly don't read or know Hebrew. In Isaiah 49 and 6, number one, the term also does not appear. Anybody watching my live stream, look. It says, Nathan, give it there, but not also. Understand something. We've already alluded to and pre-qualified these this Gentile concept. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that a man of sin a man of sin shall be revealed, the son of perdition. So a falling away from uh, uh, Israel, from being Israel, had to occur. And this is when Israel became like unto Gentiles. Uh, this is uh, Romans 9, starting at 24. Even us, whom he hath called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he saith also in O.C., I will, them, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not my beloved. Now when we go to Hosea, in the 10th chapter, uh, yet the, oh, oh, where should I say, yes, uh, Hosea 1 and 10, uh, not the 10th chapter, the first chapter. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor number, and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, ye are the sons of the living God. So this entire concept is that Israel fell away and lost their identity and need to, needed to be brought back to their identity. Notice nobody addressed Acts 3 and 19 that I brought out where it was talking about Israelites being converted. What were they being converted to? Back into who they are, man. What you're doing is not understanding the totality of the scriptures and cherry-picking as opposed to reading all things in context and letting them flow fluidly. All right, Elder Maurice, you can respond. Go ahead. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, say to the brother that I appreciate his critique, um, and I will um, 
consider that uh, when teaching and when and doing debates. This is my second debate, and there's a method to my madness. Uh, iron sharp is iron, and the more you do these things, the better you get. So I wasn't offended. I appreciate him being honest and telling me that I need to speak with more authority um, in my voice. I'm a laid-back brother, but um, I appreciate that because it does make a difference when you even read the scripture. Uh, you should read it with authority. So definitely you should teach and uh, convey the word with authority. So I appreciate that. Um, and I would like to say that uh, uh, according to Genesis chapter 12, that's the point that I was trying to make, that the foundational covenant that was made with Abraham was in that seed, all families of the earth would be blessed. And I think that we overlooked that, that that covenant with Abraham is how Israel was fostered. You know, it was it was Abraham that God made the covenant through first. And when you really think about it, um, even though Israel was given the law, it's really uh, the Abrahamic covenant that's the anchor. Because every time God dealt with Israel, he kept saying he remembered the covenant he made with their fathers, with Abraham. He delivered them out of Egypt because he remembered his covenant with Abraham. Uh, in one of the scriptures that I provided, it says that um, if they disobeyed his covenant, that the covenant he made with Abraham would save them, that he would remember that covenant. And so when we go back to that covenant, we have to read it in its entirety, as, as the early Hebrew said, to read it in context. Why would he say that all families of the earth would be blessed if he didn't mean it? I mean, if God foreseeing this, he should say, you know, through this covenant, you know, just your seed or just a particular nation. But then with Isaac in Genesis chapter 26, he says it again, all nations of the earth. So he says all families of the earth with Abraham. With Isaac, he says all nations of the earth. So, you know, I think that we ought to look at, as he stated, that they were to be a light to the Gentiles and that God would show his power, his laws, his, you know, they were to be a prototype, if you will. And they failed at that. And so in the New Testament, it says that the law um, was weak through the flesh and that the law kept them until faith came. Um, and so we see that the law, was our schoolmaster, Galatians chapter 3 says, to lead us to Christ. There was a purpose for the law. It wasn't, it was to lead us to Christ. Now that we're under a schoolmaster, it says, we know, now that we're uh, not under the law, that faith comes, it says we're not under the schoolmaster anymore. So uh, now the, the law is written on our heart. And so, you know, the Hebrew Israelites, they need, they have to graduate from that. They want to, they're like the uh, Judaizers of the New Testament trying to force the law and old things in a new. Yeah, I apologize, uh, uh, Elder Maurice Edwards. Uh, but we have some more people standing by. We kind of like went out of time. Once again, guys, we're trying to get as much people as possible, guys. I know there's a lot of people standing by with their questions and their comments. So I'm going to do the best I can to get to everybody. So we're going to go to the next caller. Uh, this is caller number three, actually. Let's go to caller number three. And like I said, uh, caller number four is going to receive an official Lions Den T-shirt. So once again, I appreciate you guys for calling in and uh, checking out the Bay Talk Free Radio. Let's go to caller number three right now, though. Uh, three four seven three three nine. You're live on the Bay Talk Few. Yeah, it's long, brother. Sal, this is brother Kyle from Brooklyn, New York. Hey, what's going on, my brother? How you doing? All right, all is well, beloved. I had a quick question, uh, comment, and a question for the Gorilla Hebrew. First of all, I like to rise and give all praise due to Allah, give all praise due to His Prophet, the Holy Noble Juali, peace be upon him. I like to give honors to Marcus Garvey, who was the forerunner for the Prophet, and like to give honors to everyone here in attendance tonight, to all our speakers, the Gorilla Hebrew, and Brother Elder Maurice, to all of you, I bid you Islam, which means peace. Uh, Islam, bro. Gorilla, indeed. Uh, Gorilla Hebrew, my question for you is, um, you know, I found, I found it very ironic that you were saying earlier that, you know, we need to take the scriptures in its totality, but I feel like, you know, unfortunately, you aren't living up to what you said. I feel like you're not reading the scriptures and putting everything in its proper context. As a matter of fact, I like, because I don't want to hold up too much time, I like to quickly go to Romans chapter 9, verse 6. And by the way, I'm reading from the King James Version. 
It says, not as though the word of God have taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Now, if you go to Romans chapter 2, uh, verses 28 and 29, it's, let's put it in context. It says, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither mm-hmm. is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, and not in the letter, who prays is not of men, but of God. So I mm-hmm. feel like right there, that's telling us that when it says who is the Jews, who are the Israelites, it's not just talking about who is one as far as bloodline, who is one as far as who is born a Jew, but it's, it's referring to those who are Jews in spirit. And the only way you can do that, obviously, is by what? Following the laws, the statutes, and the commandments. Now, don't take my word for it. Let us continue and go into another scripture that I feel like is very important and explains to us what salvation is. Now, this one, I'm about to say, I need you to bear with me on this one. I will, I will read it as quickly as possible. Is Isaiah chapter 56, verses 1 through 8. And again, I'm still in the King James Version. It says, Thus saith the Lord, keep ye judgment. And do justice, for my salvation is near to come, and righteousness to be revealed. Mm-hmm. Blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, mm-hmm. saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the Enoch mm-hmm. say, Behold, I am a dry tree. Here's where it gets interesting, family. Pay attention. Mm -hmm. For thus saith the Lord unto the Enoch that keep my Sabbath and choose Mm -hmm. the things that please me and take hold of my covenant, even unto them will I give mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also, Mm -hmm. the sons of the stranger that joined themselves to the Lord and serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants. Everyone that keep the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called an house of prayer for all people. The Lord oh, God, God, which gathered the outcasts of Israel, saith, yet will I gather others to him beside those yeah. that are gathered unto him. And my last scripture that I would like to share for the family tonight, Jeremiah 18, verses 7 through 10, King James Version. It says, At what instant shall I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it? If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, even, excuse me, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good, whereas I said I would benefit them. So, again, brother, you know, if we put these scriptures in context with the whole totality of the argument and discussion we're having tonight, is letting us know that salvation is for all those who follow the laws, the statutes, and the commandments of God. And we cannot just say that because one is not an Israelite as far as out, outwardly, that they are not entitled to salvation and they are not entitled to the covenant before our law is not the author of confusion. It says here in the scriptures, who is entitled to salvation? Yeah, hold on, my brother. Hold on, Kyle. I got to let my brother Gorilla Indeed. respond. Go ahead, respond, brother. Notice he didn't read anywhere where it said salvation would come to the other nation. Now, first I want to address Isaiah 56 before I even get into everything else. People love to go to Isaiah 56. No one here said that the house of the Lord was not going to be a house of prayer for all nations. Nobody ever said that. In the kingdom of heaven, everybody in every nation of people on the planet Earth are going to be required to, whether they're with it or not, serve the Most High God of Israel. So, yes, they are. it is going to be a house of prayer for all nations. That didn't say, notice it said the eunuch, it didn't say the stranger was going to receive salvation. That's the funny thing. But now he, he referenced the Jew inwardly and outwardly. There's something called the Israel of God, which I already read about. Number one, Isaiah, I mean, not Isaiah, really. Revelation 7 and 4 
tells us who the Israel of God is, the 144,000, 12,000 out of the 12 tribes of Israel. Then I already read in 2 Ezra 3 and 36 where it says only if, matter of fact, I can get it one more time so I can uh, show this point because he brought out the point about, well, the nation that do this, the nation that do that. Now, even if the it's a hypothetical possibility that a nation could do it, the scriptures tell us that these nations did not turn from their wickedness and only Israel ever obeyed the Most High according to the flesh. This is Second Ezra three and twenty six. I mean, Second Ezra three and thirty six. Rather, thou shalt find that Israel by name kept thy precepts, but not the heathen. Meaning, none of those other nations kept the law, statutes, and commandments outside of Israel. Now, real quick, let me get this. This is Romans nine and three. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and glory and the covenant and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises whose fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came who was over all God blessed forever. Amen. Meaning to even be a part of the Israel of God, you must physically be an Israelite first. Then you must be an Israelite who properly obeys the most high God to actually be qualified to be a part of the elect. That's plain and simple. Again, you're not Understanding the scriptures in totality. Uh, I disagree, brother. Again, that's your interpretation, like you said earlier, because I don't need you to tell me what, that what I just read. Brother, I need you to refute point, point brother. Let me respond. It's long, brother. Let give me a chance to respond. Because, again, I don't want to, like, take up too much time, but when I just read the verse, it said in Romans, it said it talked about how a Jew is not only one who is one outwardly, but who is one inwardly. So that just basically totally just – Killed every no, brother, you just brother, said. You have to brother, understand that. that. that yeah, brother, yeah, brother, 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 brother. You're, not, uh, you're not understanding, my brother. I, I just qualified that. You have to first be a Jew outwardly to even be qualified to be a Jew inwardly. I just qualified that. That's number one. I said the Israel of God. All of Israel is not going to get deliverance when Christ comes back to the earth. That's not what's going to occur. That's clear in, in the scriptures. That's not what's going to occur. What's going to occur is the elect the ones who are Israel both outwardly and inwardly are going to get the salvation. And that's what the scriptures clearly illustrate. Revelation 7 says the 12,000 of the 12 tribes of Israel, that's the elect. That's period, my brother. All right, Elder Maurice, you can respond, brother. You got the floor. Okay, well, first of all, I'd like to commend my brother for coming in with Isaiah 56. If he listened to my opening statement, uh, I alluded to Isaiah 56, uh, 3 through 8. Uh, number two, in the kingdom of uh, uh, God, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, it clearly states that there are certain people who will enter into the kingdom of God. Uh, so uh, whether servant or whatever he's saying, uh, those who are unrighteous are going to the lake of fire. They won't enter into uh, God's kingdom. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6 and 9 says, No adulterer, fornicator, uh, effeminate, or, uh, nor abuser, uh, nor thieves, nor covetous, drunkards, none of them will enter into, inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, secondly, the 12,000 uh, from each tribe are, are going to be used in Revelation for a purpose, but I think in Romans chapter 11, uh, Paul is very clear that all Israel will be saved if they abide not in unbelief. So it's not just, you know, a certain number. The 144,000, I think people misinterpret who they are and what they're going to do. Um, but they will not be the only ones in God's kingdom. Um, and I just commend the brother on on the one scripture. I use that a lot, that a Jew is not one outwardly but one inwardly. And we know that the law is now written on our hearts and not on tables. For the letter killeth, but the spirit gives life. So now we we are led by the spirit and and not the letter of the law. Uh, you can go ahead with the next question. Uh, and I didn't mean to go so long on that last answer that I had. I thought you were going to cut me off or, or the buzzer was going to go off, so I apologize. That's all good, brother. It's all good for the information out there. Once again, guys, this is your time, guys. This is your time. 
with questions or comments, you know that number by now, 646-716-7320. You're now listening to the Big Talk for you. I'm your host, Sal Showtime. My special guest is the Gorilla Hebrew and Elder Maurice Edwards. The title of this debate, Can a Non-Hebrew Be Saved? So right about now, we're going to the caller number four, guys. And as I promised, uh, caller number four is going to receive an official Lions Den T-shirt. So the next phone line that I'm going to open, they got to send me an email. Hopefully you guys are writing it down right now. Uh, debate talk for you at gmail dot com. Just send me your mailing address, your shirt size, and uh, once again, I'm going to open up the phone lines for caller number four. Uh, let me let's see who it is. Let's go to two zero six four eight nine. Live on debate talk for you. Shalom, King. Shalom, King. Hey, what's up, my brother? How you doing? Oh man, how hey, y'all? Praise due to the Most High, Barakatah, Yahweh, Bashem, Yahweh, Shai. Shout out to Sal. Shout out to my bro, Alizar Bun, lawyer representing at Sakari San Diego. Salam, King Salam. Hey, right, I don't forget that. Don't fall on. Don't forget to send me that email, brother. You want that official T-shirt? <laughs> hey, I need that T-shirt, man. I need right. that in my life. I gotta represent it out here on the West Coast for this debate talk for you. But let me get into a couple of scriptures real quick. I ain't going to take too much time. I got a, I got a question, and I got a couple of scriptures for the, um, the pastor. And shalom to the pastor, too, man. He's trying to do the best he could do. This is my question to you. Were all 12 disciples of who the world calls Jesus Christ Israelites? From what I remember, they all were Jews, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Now, I'm going to read a scripture real quick, and I want you to give me your interpretation on the okay. scripture, even though it's plain. This There's is Matthew, the 10th okay. chapter. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Um, in the beginning of the verse, I'm going to start at verse 1. It says, and when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits. He gave them uh, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. Okay, and he goes on to list, list the apostles. Now skip down to verse 4. It says, Simon and, the Canaanite. Simon the Canaanite. So if they were all Israelites, why is he calling Simon the Canaanite? Okay. Is that the question you're asking me? Yeah. Uh, when you asked me were they all Jews, I said that they were all Jews. That was, to my knowledge, he was all Jews. Uh, but here it's, it's stating that Simon the Canaanite. So you can explain that to me. That's a new one uh, to me. <clears throat> well, much like the brother was trying to tell to you, a lot of Israelites were referred to and titled being uh, from the country or region that they uh, that they were either from, born in, or citizens of, much like they called uh, the Apostle Paul a Roman, but he was an Israelite from the tribe of Benjamin, which is clear in the scriptures. Now, that's why when you go to the Ethiopian uh, eunuch and, and the, the woman at the well, um, they were Israelites. They were just being called by the nations that they were from. Now, I want to get a couple a uh, couple more scriptures real quick. Um, this is going to be because uh, a guy had called in with Isaiah the fifty sixth chapter, which is a beautiful scripture if you understand it in its totality and edification. I'm going to just read uh, Zechariah the fourteenth chapter, and I'm going to just go to um, verse sixteen because it said, "And his house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations." This is exactly why. It says, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. So in the kingdom, the Israelites are going to reign supreme in the kingdom. Okay? Now, these other nations, they're going to do their slavery, and then they're going to be able to go back to their homeland, but they're going to have to keep the laws and they have to come pay homage to uh, the Israelites. It says, and it's verse 17, and it shall be that who, who, whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, 
even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not that have no rain, there shall be plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. Okay? Now that's clear. That's why they're going to be reverencing us and they're going to be blessed in a certain way to where they're not going to be exterminated like Esau. Now, real quick, this is Joel, the third chapter, because, you know, you mentioned the strangers. You said a lot about the strangers. And Joel gives a uh, a great account on um, actual strangers possessing the kingdom. This is going to be Joel, the third chapter. I'm going to start at verse 16. Okay, it says, The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Verse 17. So shall ye know that I am the Lord, your power dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy and there shall no strangers pass through her anymore. Okay, meaning that they're not going to be able to dwell in the kingdom. Now, and I just want to say a couple of things because I don't want to take too too long, Sal. I know uh, Brother Leron called in, and you know he mentioned um, the preserve, and and the also, and um, Brother Alazar went into that how that's not even in the Hebrew. Um, a lot of these Christians, you got to get back to the essence of what uh, these languages that these scriptures were wrote in. Now, when you go to uh, Revelation, the seventh chapter, verse nine, it speaks about after the elect, there's going to be the uh, the great multitude from all nations, which uh, the brother Alazar brought out in Tobit 13, that we have to confess them to the nations and amongst the nations because that's where we were scattered. And in Jeremiah 28 and 8, it says to prophesy against these kingdoms, okay, much like the prophets did of old. So the one, the, uh, the other multitude are going to be the Israelite children, their women, and other brothers that had had different lots, it might not be the lot of the elect, but had different lots. Yeah, I apologize, my brother. I apologize. Man, you run out of time, my brother. But uh, make sure you send me that email, though, so I can send you that official Wines Den T-shirt. I appreciate you calling in to the Bay Talk you. But uh, Elder Maurice Morris, Morris, anything you want to say? Elder Maurice, you want to say anything? Yeah, um, I looked at some notes that I had, and uh, he brought up a good point. But um, that Simon is... Um, known to have two surnames in Scripture. He's considered Simon the Canaanite and Simon the Zealot. And that word Canaanite there is the same uh, Greek word uh, uh, zealous, Z-E-L-O-T-E-S. Uh, he wasn't an inhabitant of, of Canaan, and he wasn't a Canaanite. Um, he wasn't an inhabitant of Canaan, neither was he a Canaanite? But that word is used in the translation for a zealot. That that actual Simon is one called Simon the Lesser, Simon the Zealot, um, and so that's what that's all about. He he wasn't a Canaanite. I'll, I'll find some notes on that. And that's, that's the answer to that. I go to Hebrew. That I love it. I love it when guys do this. I've seen countless Christian pastors. Use that. Um, the funny thing is, the word there in the scripture the brother used is Strong's G twenty five eighty one, Kenanios, Kenanios. Now let's take a look at what the word zealot is in the Hebrew, uh, and I mean in the Greek. It's not has nothing to do with Kenanios. Okay, let me um, let me narrow this down real quick. Zealous. Let's go to zealous in the Greek. Uh, zelo, zelo. Notice those two words don't even sound alike at all. What happens is Christian pastors and theologians who don't want to accept the fact and the truth that those Gentiles or those people who are described as foreigners are actually Israelites will try to say, well, well, Simon was a zealot because he was a member of the sect of the zealots of Israel, but he was also known as the Canaanite. Those two words are totally unrelated, and only someone who has zero understanding of the Greek language would make that. Or somebody with an agenda would make would would actually try to make those two words the same. Again, look it up. Strong's uh, G twenty two oh six is zealous, and then when you go to real quick, let me make sure we got this. Um, and then Strong's G twenty five eighty one is Canaanite. 
okay? Please explain to me the relation that Canaanites and people who are zealous have with each other. None. Those are two different um, descriptors of one particular individual. Uh, Sal. Yeah, I'm here, I'm here brother. Oh. I'm here. Hey, okay. I'm here. I'm now, now listen to this. Now, here's the very, here, here is the, uh, the site that I've seen him use. Okay, blueletterbible.org. Okay, uh, when you go into the Greek, Kenneo, this on my life. Hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you go in onto the same site, blueletterbible.org. People who are in the audience, go to blueletterbible.org. Type in Canaanite. In the New Testament, Greek is going to say Canaanios. I guess that's how you explain, how you uh, pronounce it. K-A-N-A-N-A-I-O-S. Strong's G, uh, 225-81. You click on it. It says Canaanite equals Zealous, the surname of Apostle Simon, otherwise known as Simon Zealot. Now, if I'm lying, everybody just go go to go to blueletterbible.org, type in Canaanite, and tell me, do you not see Canaanios in the definition, outline of biblical usage, Canaanite, zealous? And you can do it too, Sal. And tell me, All right, now, tell, now me that, tell me now, that I just tell me that I just here's make this up or does it say that? You, you didn't just make this up, and I already showed it, like, and I already explained how the word zealous in the Greek, this is the thing, and this is the problem when people look at a, a dictionary definition and take it for what it is all the time. You have to literally study the language. A Greek, if We're you want to take it as it is, listen, or they wouldn't put it there. Listen, listen, number one, again, you're not a scholar in linguistics on any level, and clearly you showed it when you do what you do. If you go up to a Greek person and say Canaanios, they're going to think you're talking about a Canaanite, not a zealot, because that's not the word. Zelo is the word for zealot. Canaanios, let me ask you something, right? If many Greek words are transliteration of Hebrew words, please explain to me why Canaanios, which is a transliteration of the term Canaanite, would be transliterated from Hebrew to Greek as zealous. The word Canaan doesn't allude to zeal at all. What you were doing? Okay, is, so are you telling you are you telling thinking, this Greek lexicon that is wrong, and then up under I'm it has got the two scriptures that the, listen, that the word is in Matthew ten and okay, four now, and Mark okay, three and, and, and eighteen. And now listen, in both of these verses, as we're looking at, it's not in refers it's not in reference to zeal or anything having to do with zealous. It's in reference to a surname that Simon has to understand something. Biblical scholars, what they did was. They took the fact that Simon was surnamed the Canaanite and likened it unto the fact that it was uh, uh, indicative of zealous because Simon is also surnamed a zealot because he was a member of the sect of the zealot. What you have to do is actual, the scripture says, study shall I self approve. You have to do actual comparative study. This word, nowhere in the Greek language, is ever referred to zealot. It's always in reference to somebody, a native of the land of Canaan, my brother. Here's. And what you do is when you just read something and take it for what it is without truly doing the study and just taking anything anybody puts in the book for truth, you are robbing yourself of the true knowledge, my brother. I'm not robbing myself. I, I looked up the word just like I look it up in any other dictionary, and that's what it says. You, right, you're well, making it a well, part of what you, you I want you to part. ask somebody who is an expert. In yeah, hold on, brothers. We got some more questions out here. <laughs> we got some more questions out here. Once again, this is the Bait Talk for you radio, guys. You're now officially inside the <laughs> And you know that number by now, 646-716-7320. Once again, this is the Bait Talk for you radio. So we got to get to the people. We got like 10 minutes on the air, guys, but we're going to definitely go into the overtime part of the show so uh, before the time runs out via internet, you're gonna have to call in. They hear the rest of the show. They hear the final statements. And as you know, the number six four six seven one six seven three two zero. So we're gonna get a few more questions, and after that, we're probably gonna get some quick comments, and then go to the final statements. So let's go to the people, though. Let's see what they gotta say. Let's go to the next person. Five eight six nine seven seven. You're live in air. Hey, this is uh, brother Les Maurice. How you doing? Good, my brother. All right. 
Hey, it's uh, been a good debate. Um, a lot of things been said, but I'll just cut to the chase and say that I do believe that a non-Israelite can be saved because of Romans 1.16. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And... Um, no disrespect to the guerrilla Hebrew, but he says a lot of things that are, I think are un unfounded, and the foundation is weak. For one thing, I mean, you asked the question about grafting in, and you, you can graft in two different plants. I mean, God would not give an analogy that we can't duplicate. So he gave an example. That's a common horticulture practice. Second, um, talking about the uh, Esau and Edom, the definitions there, uh, going to the women, I, I don't even know where he gets that from. And I guess part of the problem is everybody has their own source. You know, you go to a uh, um, Jehovah's Witness, they're going to read out of their book. You go to a Mormon, they read out of their book. You go to a Muslim, they read out of their book. But it's not coming from the Bible. And um, I, just, I just think the things that are said were not really based on any good foundation. I don't want to beat this horse to death again, but world does not mean government or Israel. And, and when you start with that foundation, you're going to just build something that's going to crumble down. So uh, I'm, I believe we can be saved. I mean, God said he, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And God created us in his image and in his likeness. And he wouldn't just create Israelites, save them, and toss away everybody else. We who receive Jesus Christ can be saved. So I'll just kind well, of leave the, it at the, that. And, let, the, uh, let the gorilla even respond. I'm, okay. I'm going to let him come back. Let him come back. Okay, yeah, brother. Yeah. It, 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 it's so crazy. Like, I, like this guy, your, your homeboy, Pastor Maurice, could go and read the definition, and you're with that because it helps you. But as soon as I read a definition that world doesn't mean world, it means government, you got a problem with it. Like, this shows how unbalanced and biased a Christian is. And here's the crazy thing. Like, you know, us as black people in this country are descendants of slaves. You mean to tell me that the same people that castrated your forefathers, that lynched, hung, beheaded, and raped our foreparents can still receive salvation? Do you, you're, what you're doing is you're, you're basically accusing God, the Most High God, of being unjust. Now, the scriptures say that the world was created for the elect's sake. Now, let's find out who the elect is briefly, because he said, well, why would he make all of these people and, and throw them away. There's a reason for their creation. The world was printed for the elect's sake. Now watch this. This is Isaiah 45 and 4. For Jacob my servant's sake and Israel mine elect. I have even called thee by name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. So even though Israel has went off, Israel is still the elect. Israel still is the Lord's servant. And the world was created for Israel. Now when you go to Isaiah 14, 1 and 2, it clearly tells you what all the people of the earth outside of Israel were created to do, and that's to serve Israel. I already went into Isaiah 14, Isaiah 60, and Isaiah 61, where it clearly tells us the roles that non-Israelites will play in the kingdom, which is merely as a servant and a slave to Israel. Again, with that madness that you're coming with, you cannot go precept upon precept, and you cannot combat every single scripture that I'm coming out with. Notice, none of y'all can out-precept me. All the scriptures I got, you do not have an answer for all of them. Reason being is we the most high God. We could one by one, and there are answers That's to true. them. Well, I want, you, I want you to one by one refute every single scripture that I've brought out since the beginning of this um, debate. I can't, man, there was so much me thrown out there, I can't. But I will say this, I mean, if we, you know, you go one by one and there's not enough time, but like even what you're saying, because we read a definition, for instance, your term of Gentile is wrong. I mean, it's a strong number, 1484, it means ethnos. My it brother, doesn't mean there's three brother, different brother, types I'm and it refers defined. to a non-Jew. Here's, here's what you have to understand. Here's what you have to understand, what, you, what you're not understanding, is you have something called a doctrinal definition, meaning no matter what any dictionary says, what the scriptures define as something supersedes any dictionary when you're dealing with theology. So when when you can look at the Webster's definition for sin, and it's not going to say the same thing said in 1 John 3 and 4, but 1 John 3 and 4 supersedes anything that a man wrote in the dictionary. You have to understand that. So when you go to Romans 9, and then you plug that back in with Hosea 1, in reference to the Gentiles, then you have an understanding of who those Gentiles are because the Bible defines those as Israelites who have lost their way, nationality, identity. No, that's okay? not true. That's 
Exactly. You cannot prove that. that. The Bible doesn't say anything about that. Even when you go back to Jeff Romans so chapter Romans 2, when you talk about Hosea the scriptures one, of who's a Jew and who's not a Romans Jew, nine, the whole the one, discourse is about Gentiles, people who were not of the Hebrew nation, because Romans 2, 14, 16 says, For when the Gentiles, this is non-Jew, which have not the law, because the law was given to the, gen- to the Jews, so they don't have the law. Do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves. So he's talking about people who did not have the Mosaic law, Gentiles. And that's when he drops Listen, down to brother, verse 28, brother, talking about inwardly this, this and outwardly. Wrong, this is what's wrong with a Christian. This is what's wrong with a Christian. What you do is... <laughs> You totally ignore all the scriptures that were brought out before this and only go to the ones you want to go to. I have pre-qualified the biblical definition of Gentiles in which they can receive salvation. I need you to refute that Romans 9 and Hosea 1 tells us that Israelites will be called Gentiles and there will be a falling away from Israel and Israel will lose who they are. I need you to deny the history of the Hellenization, the Hellenized period when the Greeks went into Israel and forced all the Israelites into Greek customs. I need you to refute that. I need you to tell me that those things didn't happen and those scriptures don't exist for what you are saying to be true, my brother. And that's what you're not doing. You're just trying to act like I didn't say anything and go into what you're talking about. That's what you're doing. And what you're doing is abusing the scriptures, and you make it, and, and, and you basically are, are, are shaming the most high with that madness you're doing right now. All right, well, we got to go with Elder Maurice, man. I guess we can make that another show. <laughs> well, Elder Maurice, go ahead. Uh, first of all, the word Gentile is a Latin word, and it was inserted into the Bible by English translators. Um, and so we, we have to look at what they use the word for. Um, and historically, that that is what has been said about using the word Gentile. As a matter of if you go back to the etymology of it, it really meant a non-Roman citizen if, if, in its etymology in the Latin if you look it up, the, the etymology of it. Uh, number two, if you look at the scripture where it says that Jesus would be delivered to the Gentiles to be mocked and scourged, well, we know that, that Jesus wasn't delivered to uh, his own people, but he was delivered to the Romans to be mocked and scourged. So we know that those Gentiles, had, <laughs> they, they were Romans. Um, and so... That, that's all I have to say about that part of it as far as the Gentiles are concerned. And what else, what else are they saying? Um, I think that's the only other other point that he made. And then, uh, uh, yeah, as far as in the Old Testament, talking about the Egyptians, just, just the women, uh, when, they, when they addressed a nation, when they said Egyptian or Canaanite or Edomite, it, it meant, you know, it meant the people not just a particular gender of the people. So, yeah, that, that was something that was inserted by uh, the Gorilla Hebrew, in my opinion. Uh, but go ahead, Sal, with the next question. All right, guys, we have like two minutes and three seconds on the air. If you want to hear the rest of the show, you have to dial that number right about now, 646-716-7320. We're just going to take a few more questions and a couple more comments, and after that we're going to go to the final statements, guys. So if you want to hear the final statements live on the Bay Talk for you right about now, once again, you got to dial that number, 646-716-7320. Once the time runs out, you're going to hear the rest of the show via phone, or you can just go back later on and check out the archive. The show is archived. So once again, go to the website, www.blogtalkradio.com slash debate talk for you. we got to go to the next person, guys. we got to go to the next person. Uh, 773-593. You're live on debate talk for you. Seven seven three five nine three. You're live on air. Hey, y'all there? Hello. Hey, how you doing? Yeah, I can hear you. How you doing? Hey, yeah, peace to the Lord to you all. Peace to the Lord. Uh, brother Maurice, uh, I'll, first I'd like to commend you, brother, on uh, on what you're doing today. Uh, you, you're hitting it right on the head. Uh, brother uh, Gorilla, uh, I'd like to commend you on your past debate uh, with uh, Islam. However, uh, towards you, you are way off base, sorely off base on this. And we're going to begin with first about... Let me ask you, first, have you, have you read the scripture about Peter uh, when he baptized the Romans at his household and the Holy Spirit fell on them? And if the kingdom of God was not for the Gentiles, then, then why bother to preach them, you know, the gospel? And this is what Peter, this is what Peter had said to, uh, to, uh, to the Romans. He said, uh, 
you know that it is unlawful, an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew, now he's talking about himself, to keep company or to come one of another nation. Now he's talking to Cornelius, the Roman. But God has shown me that uh, I should not call no man common or unclean. This is in Acts 10, 27. So he's talking to a Gentile, and notice salvation is coming to a Gentile, because right after he said that, Cornelius and all his house were baptized. And not only were they baptized, the Holy Spirit fell on them. And the Holy Spirit is going to fall on those, the, on those that are uh, deemed worthy uh, of the Lord's grace and salvation. Okay? And what about this vision that uh, John, uh, John saw? And he said, after this, I beheld a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindred. Now, keep in mind kindred, the word kindred. And people and tongues. And they stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palms in their hands. And they all cried with a loud voice, salvation to our God. Now, when it said all nations, it meant just that. All nations or all is an absolute, brother. But you erroneously believe it's speaking only about Israelites. Look here. Israelite is one nation. I apologize, my brother. I apologize, man. We're in the overtime part of the show, and we only have uh, 30 minutes left. So, you know, i got to utilize it as much as possible. And uh, let me let uh, Gorilla Hero respond very quickly. Go ahead. Yeah, it's so funny what these people, like, I already covered what he – and here's the thing. The scriptures are so dense, you know, they're so vast. But these guys, they only have a few scriptures they can really go to to actually push their agenda. More scriptures support what I'm saying than support what they're saying because the scriptures that they're saying are scriptures that they're mangling. And I've already went into this, but again, for the millionth time, Tobit 13 and 3, confess him before the Gentiles, ye children of Israel, for he hath scattered us among them. So the only reason why we were preached to all nations of the Gentiles is because we were scattered among the Gentiles. Now, in reference to the dream that was had, that was the prelude to the baptism of Cornelius, Again, let's go to Second Ezra three uh, eight rather, front of the twenty ninth verse. Let it not be thy will to destroy them which have lived like beasts, to look upon them that have clearly taught thy law. So the Israelites lived like the beasts of the field. Beasts of the field is a metaphysical term seen oftentimes in the Old Testament in reference to the heathen. So when our people live like the heathen, they become like the beasts of the field. Then they are looked at as a beast. So we had to go to our people who are most of the Gentiles, living like the Gentiles, and convert them back into Israel as spoken about in Acts the third chapter, which I already went into. I want y'all to address the scriptures I'm bringing out instead of trying to negate them and going into whatever stuff you think backs up your claim. All right. Uh, Elder Maurice, you can respond. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I want to thank the brother for his, his uh, comment um, and his encouragement. Um, I didn't even allude to... Um, Acts chapter 10 as much as I could have because um, I, didn't, I didn't feel like going into the whole thing about uh, Cornelius being an Israelite. I, I don't see how uh, this Roman centurion can be uh, classified as <laughs> as an Israelite. Um, Paul was when you look born at, as a Roman, though, so how is that possible? When I, I'm talking about a Roman centurion, and if you do, if you look at up the uh, – the history of the centurion, who was a, a high-ranking officer over 80 to 100 uh, soldiers, that that was a position that you got uh, in the Roman army. Uh, real quick, real quick, very, pastor, 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 pastor. real quick, just one quick question. I'm gonna let you finish. Wait a minute, now, I, 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 real, I didn't interrupt you, brother. You did, you did, you did in, in one time. You did so. I just want to just one time, real quick. What's that? You're talking about a high uh, member of the, of the Roman of the uh, Roman army. I understand something. Have you ever heard of somebody named Septimius Severus? He was a high-ranking, a black man from North Africa that was a high-ranking member of the Roman army that got his way all the way up to emperor. So for you to uh, uh, present to us the idea that it's impossible for a non-Roman or a non or a Jew, an Israelite, to get in a high rank amongst the Romans, you're showing you you historically have no knowledge of the Roman Empire and how it works. Okay, during during this time when the church was being persecuted by the Romans, uh, there were no Jews that became a high ranking officer. But anyway, can you um, prove that? 
I, I thought I was asking, um, answering his question. I didn't know I was in, in the rebuttal with Jim here. Okay. Any anyway, uh, the brother brought out some good scriptures and interpreted them uh, very well. Um, and so we can go into our closing arguments because um, we, we need to get, I need to get down here in the next 10 minutes. All right, so you know what? Let me just take uh, maybe one more caller real quick, and after that we can go into the final statements. I guess, you know, do the time, you know. Got to go to the next person. Let's take one more caller, and after that we're going to, you know, maybe make a few quick comments real quick. So let's go to the next caller. Back back, and we'll make a quick comments right now. Quick comments. Uh, let's go to eight six five three eight five. You'll have a debate talk for you. Quick comments. Quick, quick comments. Got. Five. Hey, how you doing? How you doing? You live in the air, brother. Quick comments. You live in the air. Shalom. It is me. Shalom. I'm on. All right. Um, live in the air. I just got a. <laughs> Yeah, um, I just got a quick question. Um, first, I'm going to bring up the jailer and Acts. It wasn't he a Philippian, and um, it was said that he is, he was a, uh, he received Christ. And I also want to bring up the one who died beside him on the cross when uh, Christ himself said he would be in paradise with him that day. So do we know if he was an Israelite or not? Or um, does the Philippian give way that Gentiles can be saved? All right, brother, you know, good question, but we don't have no time right now. We've got to get some quick comments from the people out there, quick comments. Let's take one, two more, 410 quick comments. You're live in there. Debate talk for you. Go ahead. Hello? 410. Hey, how you doing? You're live in there, brother. Quick comments. Yeah, i got a quick comment. Um, if I was to pre- the, preach the Israelite doctrine with a 501c charter, would I lose it? Shout out to um, Alizar out, out there in San Diego. This is Teddy. All right, my brother. Appreciate that. Uh, another quick comment. Let's go to 910551. Quick comment. It's live in air. Okay. I want to uh, give a suggestion to the, the people who follow Zeus. Uh, the borders versus lineage discussion needs to be uh, drilled into your minds very thoroughly. So you got to understand the lineage with parents, with actual parents, and the difference between borders, and apply that to your biblical studies. I appreciate that quick comment. I'm going to take one more quick comment. Just, I'm squeezing in one more. Let's go to Skype caller. Somebody calling from Skype. You're live on the Bay Talk for you. Skype caller, quick comment. Hey, Shalom, Brother Sal. Uh, just a quick comment real quick. If you go to Hebrews 11th chapter, you will find Rahab the harlot, who was a Canaanite, listed among the faithful. So Rahab is going to be in the kingdom and not listed as a concubine, not listed as a servant. She's going to be in the kingdom. Last thing, Second Chronicles 6 and 32, the definition of a stranger. Moreover, concerning the stranger, which is not of thy people Israel, but has come from a far country for thy great name's sake. So Solomon prayed to the Most High that strangers who were not Israelites, if they come and pray toward this house, that the Most High would hear them. So anybody who's teaching that a stranger will not be in the kingdom is not reading the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Shalom, Sal. I appreciate that, my brother. Appreciate that. All right, guys, we've got to go to the final statements. You know, I wish I could get to everybody, like I always say, but time doesn't permit. Plus, my brother, Elder Maurice Edwards, got to go. So we're going to get this final statement thing started. Once again, guys, I appreciate you guys for tuning in to the Big Talk for you. The show is archived, so if you missed any part of the show, just go to the website. But let's get this thing started. Let me open up Elder Maurice Edwards' phone line, and you can go ahead, brother. you got seven minutes for your final statements. Go ahead. Yeah, I won't use up the uh, whole seven minutes. I want to uh, thank you for the opportunity to come on debate, talk for you, and debate this uh, very important topic of can a nine Hebrew be saved? Um, big shout out to my brother, uh, the Gorilla Hebrew. Um, he uh, is very sharp, so he uh, causes a brother like myself to go into deep study to uh, be apologetic in uh, what I believe and what I teach. Um, I think that I provided enough scriptures in the Old Testament to prove that uh, what a stranger is and that a stranger could join themselves to the Lord and to uh, the Israelites. In the New Testament, I think I've provided um, enough scripture to show that God desires all 
men to be saved, that he was reconciling the world through Christ, that Christ died for the sins of the world. I think that the Hebrew Israelites have tunnel vision. They think that God's will began and ends with the Israelites. I think that uh, those who called in uh, gave some other scriptures to support it. Um, uh, my my view of, of teaching concerning salvation, um, if we had an hour to teach it, I think we would bring out those other scriptures as well. But with a 15 uh, to 20 minute opening, we uh, try to give as many scriptures as we can. Um, but as the brother pointed out, that there are many nations and for God to choose one nation and to have a kingdom of, of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in just one nation dwelling in the kingdom is uh, doesn't even, even you know seem rational with the creation that he created. Um, the world was not created for the Israelites. In Colossians chapter 1, it says that the earth was created by him for him. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, and the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, uh, the psalm says. So I, I believe that the, uh, in, in my closing, I would say that um, the Israelites uh, need uh, not try to strip the church of its identity, and the church needs not strip Israel of its identity. Uh, there are prophecies and promises that still have to be fulfilled as far as Israel is concerned. And the church, which is Jew and Greek or Jew and Gentile, has promises and prophecies. And I think that we need to stop being like kids on both sides, kicking in the sandbox, saying that's my father and not yours. But God is the father of all. And uh, you all be blessed. Uh, once again, Elder Maurice Edwards, I appreciate you uh, bringing forth the official rematch right here on Debate Talk for you. I appreciate the information that you brought out to the masses out here. No doubt. And um, let the people know uh, verbally where they can find you. Uh, you know, let them know where they can find you on social media. Uh, you can find my YouTube channel, and I haven't been on there uh, in a while. I did a couple of uh, webcam videos, but I haven't done any official videos, so I think you can still go. I think the the uh, address is still youtube.com forward slash uh, user forward slash liberating truth. I believe that's how you do it. I, I haven't posted the link in a long time. But my channel is Liberating Truth. And uh, then on uh, Facebook, I'm just at, uh, I guess, facebook.com, uh, Elder Maurice Edwards. And I got a lot of up-and-coming stuff, but but right now, uh, I just have the YouTube channel. Um, and then if you need to email me, uh, Elder M. Edwards at Yahoo.com. That's Elder M. Edwards at Yahoo.com. And uh, I look forward to hearing from some of the people out there as I do some things in the future. Yeah, once again, my brother's on. and a pleasure to have you on the show, and hopefully we get you back on Season 5. On yeah, no doubt. You. No doubt. All right, so now let's go to Guerrilla Hebrew with his final statements. Once again, that's going to be seven minutes each. And, um, you know, let me do that right now. Open up the phone line. Brother, you can go ahead with your final statement. Yeah, uh, you know, I want to just give a big shout-out to um, to Maurice for coming out on this one. Um, you know, it's no hard feelings. You know, we're just trying to hash out what's best for our people. Um, and it's definitely not best to accept everybody, especially after what they've done to us historically. Um, real quick, uh, you know, Pastor just alluded to, and one of the callers alluded to, um, that there weren't going to be that that it's crazy to think that there weren't going to be any heathens in the kingdom. I never said that. I actually blatantly said there was going to be heathens in the kingdom, and what their position in the kingdom would be, which is a servant and a handmaid to Israel. That's clear in the scriptures: Isaiah 14, Isaiah 60, Isaiah 61, and elsewhere. All these people are created to be Israel's possession, just as Israel is really for as Christ's possession, as Christ is a, the Most High's possession. That's just the order. That's just the way it works. Um. Well, what I want to do is I want to read this here in Luke, the first chapter, in reference to the birth of who the world is going to be called Christ, real name Yahweh Shai, and what Zechariah said concerning him when the Holy Spirit came over him. It says Luke 1 and 67. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and have raised up a horn of salvation for us in the throne of his servant David. And he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, 
which have been since the world began, that we should be saved. So it's funny that they bring up this whole thing um, with, oh, you know, the Noah and all these people. Yeah, Noah and them were, were technically not Israelites, but the scriptures blatantly say here that since the world began, Israel's salvation has been prophesied. Verse 70 again, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we we should be saved from our enemies. These other nations are our enemies. How could our enemies then have a part in our salvation when we're getting saved from them? It just doesn't make sense. And from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy prophesied to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which we swear to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, which are the other nations, our salvation is our deliverance out of the hand of our enemies, which would be ushered in by who the world ignorantly calls Christ, okay, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, talking about who the world ignorantly calls Christ, Yahweh Shai, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of sins. Now, I just did a video, which will be out, Lord willing, either tonight or tomorrow, in regards to remission of sins, grace, and repentance. And when you understand that concept in totality in the scriptures from Old to New Testament, you see that it is only for Israel. Repentance is only for Israel. Remission of sins is only for Israel. Salvation is only for Israel. All these things only pertain to Israel and have been echoed since the days of the Old Testament in reference to only pertaining to Israel. What these guys want to do is they want to change things. They want to do the things that the Roman Catholic Church, they want this to be all-inclusive, okay? The Lord is never all-inclusive. He is a separatist. He is not an equalitarian, okay? And it's clear in the scriptures. Now, I'm going to go to Romans 9, and I'm going to read as much as I can before my time is out because I love to use every second I can to bring this edification out. It's Romans 9, starting in verse 1. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ, for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God bless forever, amen. I mean, you know, to, to actually formulate the hypothesis that these brothers do, they have to totally act like those scriptures don't exist, and it's just total irresponsibility. But I want to hold that, and I actually just thought of something here in 1 Corinthians, um, the 10th chapter, because they talk about, oh, the, the, a brother mentioned the Philippian and, and, and these other people, and just going back to that whole conversation about Simon the Canaanite, we have to understand something. There are key things that show us that these Gentiles are Israelites. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10, starting 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat. But... Paul here is talking to Corinthians. Corinthians are Greeks, yet he just told the Corinthians that their fathers were with Moses and passed through the sea. How is that possible? We know that the Israelites were the ones that passed through the sea with Moses, but these people are Greeks. No, they are Israelites that took on the ways of life, the, ways of, life of the Greeks and started speaking the languages of the Greeks and, and you know, following those customs. Now, he was proselytizing them, bringing them back, converting them back to Israel, as spoke about in Isaiah, the third, I mean, not Isaiah, but Acts, rather, the third chapter of the 19th and 12th verse. You have to understand the totality of these scriptures. These Gentiles, they are Israelites, and that's clear. I mean, why else would Paul tell a bunch of Greeks that their fathers were with Moses? It just doesn't make any sense. I'll go back into um, Romans 9 until my time is up. Not as though the word of God have taken an effect, for they are not all of all Israel, which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but as Isaac shall thy seed be called. Uh, that is. They which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also conceived by one even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. So Jacob is the elect. Jacob is the chosen. And nobody 
can get the reward that Jacob that Jacob had that Jacob is going to receive, which is the salvation. What shall we say that is there unrighteousness? But God, they're saying, well, look, God created all these nations. Why would He only choose Israel? God forbid there's any unrighteousness with Him doing that. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth nor him that runneth, but of God that sheweth mercy. And he sheweth mercy to Israel and Israel only. That is plain and clear in, in the scriptures. And with that, call Halal Yahweh Bashim Yahweh Shad, and Shalom. Uh, once again, Gorilla Hebrew, of course. I appreciate you uh, always coming to the Lions Den representing. Appreciate you being here. Uh, let the people know, like I said, you know, let the people know uh, where they can find you on social media verbally. Let them know where they can find you. Got yeah, uh, you know, I appreciate you too, Sal. You know, shout out to everybody out there in debate talk for you. Um, YouTube.com backslash Exodus1715. That's X-O-D-U-S-1715. YouTube.com slash Sakari1715. That's S-I-C-A-R-I-I-1715. You can also go to our website, Exodus1715.info. That's Exodus with the E. Uh, one set, the, the number is 1715.info. Facebook slash Exodus1715 with the E. Instagram slash Exodus one seven one five with the E. You know, get at us on any of those. Um, you know, any of that if you you know if you, if you want to you know get further education on any of these topics.